and record. Okay, so hi everyone. We're gonna go over the views and measurements for targeted neonatal echo so that we make sure that we standardize the way we do things. Um, and so this was a presentation that I prepared for the Bangkok uh, International Neonatal Symposium pre-Congress workshop. And we'll take advantage of that. Uh, so, I'm sure you're aware, but it, very recently in 2024, there's been very important guidelines that's been renewed uh, and updated. One of them is the guidelines regarding the recommendations for targeted neonatal echo, and the other ones are the guidelines for the pediatric transthoracic echo, and I think they're very complementary. Uh, one of them talks more about the concepts of TNE and the NICU and how to you know, use TNE to assess your patients at bedside in a very standardized fashion and integrate the information in order to provide physiological-based um, interventions that are cardiovascularly focused. Uh, the other one really talks about how to be very rigorous in terms of doing some of the measurements in, in, the, in the specific views um, to really allow uh, that we speak the same language among different echo practices. And it really helps to standardize so that we can uh, make sure that the research that we do or the publications that we do are based on kind of a similar language. And most of the time when we standardize measurements, it's because um, there's also already been a body of literature that has produced data on some of these measurements, and they've actually published it in that fashion. In the sense, the way we measure a certain valve has been already done by various cohorts and they've measured the valve like this. And so that's why we measure the valve the same way so that we're able to compare ourselves to these previous data sets. Okay, so that's the idea of standardizing because as you know, an echo is basically a film where we're trying to obtain 2D views and 2D images of a complex structure that is in 3D. And so you can take that film from multiple point of view. So it's like you're in a room and you're filming a room. I could take the view of the room from every corner of the room. And the way I'm going to be assessing the geographical space or the ge sorry, the geometrical space based on the images that I'm seeing might be very different from one point of view to, to another. So that's why it's very important we stay consistent when we when we do some of these measurements. So we'll start by the parasternal long axis view. I have given you access to these uh, slides and thank you Pasini for putting together these really wonderful sketches. I think it really represents nicely how are the different cuts in parasternal long axis. So as you can see, when you're doing all these cuts, we're obtaining uh, different views of the different structures of the heart. Um, and so, You'll find also on the Neocardial Lab website, this kind of you know very rough sketch of the central portion of the parasternal long axis view. And you can see here where we will typically position the probe on a newborn in order to obtain that view. Although, as you know, every baby is different and depending on the cardiac axis, the position of the probe, you have to adapt it, right? Like sometimes it's gonna be much more closer to the neck. Sometimes it's gonna be actually closer to the right side of the chest. And it really depends if there's shifts of the heart and how the heart is positioned in the chest. So some of the patients may have also a CDH and you may have, you know, not necessarily the chest on the usual position, which is on the left side. You may have some, you know, meso heart or, you know, uh, dextro position. So, so sometimes you have to adapt your positioning of your probe in order to obtain the view that is nicely aligned. And so typically in parasternal long axis, We'll start with the central cut, which is seeing a bit of the right ventricular outflow track on the most anterior portion of your, of your section. Uh, you're gonna see your left ventricle, you're gonna see your left ventricular outflow track, your aortic valve, your ascending aorta, and then eventually you're gonna see portion of your mitral valve, which are the portions that corresponds to section of the anterior mitral valve leaflet and posterior mitral valve leaflet with the attachment of the actual two papillary muscle. You see your left atrium that's just posterior to your aorta. And you typically will see what we call the right coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp. So in the aorta, we typically have three cusps. It looks like, um, as you know, it's a tri-leaflet valve. Uh, 
And this tri-leaflet valve is not a perfect circle. It's actually, it looks like almost like a, like a flower. And then it has three cusps. Uh, it has the right coronary cusp, the left coronary cusp, and the non-coronary cusp. And so we'll show these cusps when we do the parasternal short axis view, okay? And it's important we have the same language. I'm putting what's the most conventional language of how we speak about the anatomy of the heart. Although Pessini, I think you remember you did a session with Dr. Villan, which where she clarified that the nomenclature is sometimes a bit more fluid than what we think and probably need, will be evolving with time. Um, so this, these are the views um, of, the, of the parasternal long axis uh, as you have movements of the heart. So you can see that you have your right ventricular on top. This is the actual uh, probe is here. The marker is telling you where's the marker um, corresponding to the marker on the probe. So everything that's here is to the left side typically of the patient. If your heart is normal in terms of anatomy, obviously if you have the extra cardiac, it's gonna be flipped. Um, and this is the right side of the patient. And here you can see a scale. So this is, a, we cheated here. This is an adult, it's an adolescent heart. And you can see that this is one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, four centimeter, five centimeter. So these markers are already providing you information on the actual um, size of the heart. Okay, and you'll see that babies, these markers are much bit like a premature infants. Often you'll have like a heart that's like two centimeter. Okay, often on the image, you'll have information about the frame rate and the types of frequency you used for the probe in order to obtain these images. You get your ECG, so you're able to follow your cardiac cycle. As you know, when you're at the position of the QRS, it's typically that your heart has just, you know, is now in a relaxed mode and needs to be activated. So it's typically that when you are on the QRS, you're at the end of diastole. So that's important for the timing of your, of your measurements. So these are just to orient you to the image and to some of the information you do get on the uh, echo images. On top, you have the right ventricle. Here you have the, a portion of the septum. So the septum is a wall. So think of a wall as a very complex 3D structure. So here we're just cutting the wall in a really like short segment. So if you're, you could be moving along the wall, like in so many places, right? And you can also going up and down, right? And here we're just taking like a really, just like a one segment into the, we see the aortic valve open and close and we can see that it has very minutely flit. Under it, you have the left atrium, you have here the mitral valve and you can kind of see a bit of the papillary muscle here. And then here you have the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And then here we often see the descending aorta. Now, when you angulate posteriorly, so you're going more towards a cut that's going to be like almost perpendicular to the chest of the, of the patient because you're looking deeper into the chest. So think of cuts. The more you get in front, the more you're interior, the more you get to the back, you're more posterior, right? Because you're cutting basically. So if you cut like this, you're getting closer to the skin. Versus you go to the back, you get you know deeper. So here we're deeper and what we see, we see more of the right ventricle. We see two of the leaflets of the tricuspid valve and we see the right atrium connected oops, to your inferior vena cava. And sometimes we can even see uh, the eustachian valve. And so we know that the tricuspid valve has three leaflets and it's important to know which are some of these leaflets because sometimes the leaflets going to have like anatomical consideration. And so here we can see the interior leaflet and we can see the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. Finally, as you sweep more interiorly, you're going to start seeing your um, RVOT towards pulmonary valve, towards pulmonary artery. Uh, and so here you can see again the pulmonary valve that has very thin leaflet opening and closing. Um, and so a valve and um, the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve were obviously open during the ventricular systole because that's when blood flow is getting ejected. And so typically you will see it open, you know, you get QRS, 
activation, the ventricle will start contracting, blood flow will eject, and so you'll see it open during the ventricular systole, which is around here. Um, and, and you can also see the heartbeat here that's based on the, on the ECG tracing, okay? So let's start with a child, a baby. This is a term baby. This is, in, so the previous images were done by a GE machine. This is the images that are done by a Siemens machine. So you can see very similar information you're getting. You're getting frame per seconds here. You're getting beats per minute. Um, you're getting the frequency of the probe. So you can see already it's a higher frequency probe because it's a pediatric patient. So it's a newborn. So we're getting higher frequency because we get better resolution and because we're able, but we're able to only go uh, to a more superficial surface when we get higher frequencies. Uh, is Sylvia still on the line? Just wanted to make sure we didn't lose her. Yeah, I'm here, yeah. Per perfect. So same, you can see here very, very nicely the papillary muscle descending aorta. You can see the aortic valve open and close, the ascending aorta. You can see the septum. Uh, but you can see that we're missing the apex. So whenever we image, it's also important we use all our views to get a global sense of the ventricular structure and the ventricular function. So whenever we scan, it's important to do certain movements in order to get access to these structures. So, so here we don't see the apex, but as we would be scanning, we would probably also visualize the apex. So we can use the B mode. This is the B mode or the brightness mode uh, to get to the images, but you can also use what we call the M mode, which is the motion mode in order to get cuts. So that's, for example, of a cut. So this is a now a Phillips image where you have the line of interrogation that's here. And you can see that for at least this machine, the line of interrogation also provides you information about the distance. So this is one centimeter from the, from the probe. This is a two centimeter. This is three centimeter. This is four centimeter. So it's exactly these dots, they represent a distance actually, right? Here we can see also where we put the focus and P for Phillips because that's their particular machine uh, is the representation of where, where the cursor is, okay? Now on this image, what we see, we see the QRS, so the ECG on top, exactly how I mentioned, your QRS corresponds to typically the moment that there's gonna be ventricular activation and it's typically for the mechanical aspect of the, of the heart, the ventricular, uh, diastole, so the end of diastole. So you have here first the beginning of the wall. So we're cutting through this line and we're looking at the motion of the pixels through time along this line. So here we have, if you follow the line, first you start with the um, ventricular, the, the, um, the wall of the right ventricle, then you have the RVOT diameter or yeah, the RV diameter. And um, then you have the, the septal diameter, then you have the LV diameter and you have your posterior wall diameter. And what's very important when you do M mode is really to make sure that you can actually very visualize very nicely and crisply, very crisp, these lines. What you wanna see is nicely see the borders. Okay, and you wanna be aligned at the tip of your mitral valve. So here, I'll be honest, to my taste, I think we're a bit too much in the mitral valve. I think I would have positioned the, the cursor probably a bit lower in the ventricle to really be at the tip, okay? And what we do see here is the motion actually of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, which is on top, and then at the bottom, the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And actually in adult literature and in emergency literature uh, and in point of care ultrasound literature, they use a lot of marker that's called the E separation point. The E separation point means what? Means you can almost see, I don't know if you see the motion of this anterior mitral valve leaflet here. You, you have the mitral valve leaflet that is opening opening and then reopening, and then you get ventricular systole, and then here it's when the ventricle is contracting. 
right? So this is the filling phase, actually. This is the filling phase of the ventricle. And you get actually the, mo the motion of the valve during the early filling phase and then during the atrial contraction. So we call this the early filling passive phase and then the atrial contraction. It's like you get the movement of the valve as it's like opening during the first ventricular diastole portion where you get this gush of blood from the atrium to the ventricle. And eventually you get the atrial kick where the valve reopens again, okay? And so that's why you have the E and then eventually the A and the distance from the septum to the tip of this valve during early um, ventricular diastole is called the E separation point. We don't use it much in neonatal and in TNE, but I think it's important as you guys embark, you know these kinds of concepts because someone may ask you what it is. It's used a lot in the POCUS literature because it's a very easy marker to get and it's been associated with cardiac function. It's been associated with cardiac function. So um, the closer it is and the shorter the distance, it's typically a better function. Don't quote me on this. I would have to just double check it, but I'm pretty sure it's that. Um, I can validate just to make sure. Do you see my screen? My, what do you see? You see my Google Chrome? It's no slide. Okay, perfect. Good. So I'm just going to reshare my screen and I'm going to open this. So this is, you know, the review of the E point septal separation point. And actually it describes that you see this E and this A wave. And basically this distance is what is being used in certain point of care ultrasound literature and really an adult world. But you may be asked, you know, what exactly, um, what exactly is the E separation point? And you can see that in adults, the shorter the distance, uh, the better it's associated with like the ejection fraction. It means that the, the ventricle is basically vigorous. Okay. Now we don't use it a lot in neonatology to my knowledge, because there's not a lot of body of literature on that pretty much. Okay. Let's go back to our M mode. So what can we do on the M mode? So M mode actually is discouraged a lot by the American society of echo pediatric and adult gu guidelines. And the reason it's discouraged is that you can see that depending on how your image is and where you put your line of interrogation and where you put your probe and which cut you have, you may be cutting a very complex 3D structure in a very simple, like kind of two dimensional time and one line, right? It's not even two dimensional, like two dimensional imaging. It's like time as a dimension and then one line of interrogation is the dimension. So it's very dependent on angle. It's very depending on operator and it's only assessing a really, really, really narrow cut of your cardiac structure. But then again, there's a lot of body of literature that's been used and, and created based on this marker. And so I do think that it provides you some insight and, and an echo is a story, right? It's not about like a one marker or one view. It's about putting the whole thing together. So I think it does provide some interesting information. So for example, in TNE or in pediatric echo, we do still use a lot of this marker of M mode to get an assessment, assessment of ventricular mass or ventricular hypertrophy. So to see, for example, is the posterior wall very hypertrophy, okay? So if we go through the cardiac cycle, you have the QRS here, which is ventricular diastole. You get the RV wall, RV diameter and diastole. That's why it's RV diameter and diastole. You get the septum and diastole you get eventually the left ventricular diameter in diastole and you get the posterior wall in diastole. Then you continue, the ventricle starts contracting. Boom, 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 boom. Peak of contraction. And then eventually it restarts going into the relaxation phase. And so peak of contraction, you get the RV diameter in systole. You get the IVS, interventricular septum in systole. You get the LV in systole, and you get the LV posterior wall in systole. And there's many algorithms and, and markers that are gonna put together these things to calculate, for example, ventricular mass. Uh, or you can use some of the normative data to look at, is my posterior wall 
and diastole thicker than it should be for the age of my patient to tell me if this patient has some degree of hypertrophy, okay? Like cardiomyopathy or hypertrophy secondary to iatrogenic exposure to steroids, for example, or infant and diabetic mother, which typically they'll get more septal hypertrophy and typically the septal hypertrophy is more concentrated here. So that's why I'm saying sometimes the M mode is not so great because you may not have like homogeneous changes to your heart and that might not be picked up by the M mode. Make sense? So this is what the uh, TNE guidelines recommend. Uh, so you can see kind of this E wave and you can see that, you know, eventually you probably get an A wave here of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. You get to see the posterior wall leaflet. You get to see the posterior wall of the left ventricle and you have the left ventricular and diastolic diameter, the left ventricular and systolic diameter. And actually the distance between these two is supposed to be the ejection time. Right? So let me take a pause here and bring you on the website of the Neocardio Lab to explain something before I forget. So let's go here. So do you see the website of the Neocardio Lab? Yes, you do? Perfect. Yeah. So if you go in Paris, if you go in parasternal long axis, and a lot of the views that I'm showing are kind of represented here. Um, if you look here, the QRS is here, right? When you're at the peak of your, at, at the end of, at the end peak of diastole here, your QRS is here. And this is the peak of contraction. And eventually it starts re-relaxing. So if you, if you take this measurement, this is the ejection time. This is the time you spend in ejection. So let me just show you what I mean. There is a marker that's called the, uh, and then again, it, it's something that personally I don't use very often, but it's been described in the literature. It's called the velocity of circumferential shortening. And as you can see what it takes, it takes the um, end diastolic diameter, the end systolic diameter, and it divides by the end diastolic diameter, which is basically the shortening fraction. And it takes all of this marker and redivides it, re it by the ejection time. So some people have used just the M mode to calculate this marker as a marker of ventricular function, not something that is still very used. Some other people, what they'll do, and that's why it's so important to say, how am I doing the actual, how am I doing the actual marker? How am I measuring it? You can see that this particular other technique is using the ejection time based from the LV alpha track instead of using the M mode ejection time to, to calculate this velocity of circumferential fiber shortening. So this marker is a marker of what? It's a marker of ventricular wall stress. Um, and to be honest, it's it's been less and less used in the literature, again, because M mode is so angle dependent, because this marker is also dependent on preload, because the ejection time will change a lot with heart rate and newborns have very variable heart rates. So it's not typically a marker that personally I use that much. But I still want you to be aware that these markers exist if you read it in the literature, if you read it in an article so that you're not clueless about them, okay? So that's just M mode, okay? Um, and this M mode and this cut that you can see that the cut is through the tip of the mitral valve can also be done at the tip of the mitral valve. So this is the tip of the mitral valve and the parasternal short axis. So when you're getting your M mode in any of these views, why is it that we often use the parasternal short axis at our echo lab and at our neocardio lab is that you can see the mitral valve in his longitudinal in the longitudinal portion. So it's very easy to see, okay, this is really the tip of the mitral valve, right? Versus in parasternal short axis, you might be very well aligned, like your, your line of interrogation might be very well aligned between the two ventricles, but you really need to actually sweep and locate where is my mitral valve ending 
And where am I at, like, in terms of getting to my papillary muscle? So it's very important to take the M mode, but you need to do your sweep It's in parasitoid short axis to locate that, okay, now is my tip of my mitral valve. This is where I'm putting my M mode. The advantage with the Philips machine is that you can start putting your M mode and then still see on your image while you're doing your M mode where you are as you're doing your sweep. So you can continue sweeping and stop at the tip of the mitral valve and you know that you're at the good spot to get your M mode. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Yes. And I just wanna show you what I mean about angle dependency. Can you can see in the guidelines how they've put their lines? Actually, if you would be doing it during the scan, you wouldn't be able to do it here because your line would start from here. So your line would actually go like this. So then it would not be angled correctly. Now machines have something called um, angle correction where you can, or automated angle collection, where you can actually ask the machine to, to, to start moving your line of interrogation artificially to take a different cut if you're not well aligned. The problem doing that is that you start losing in temporal resolution. This, this resolution becomes much less cleaner and crisper, okay? So M mode, one of its advantage is that because you're getting such a narrow view, you get a very, very, very high frame rate. There's a very high frame rate here. So you get a lot of temporal resolution, resolution of time. That's what's temporal resolution. You get one cut here, one cut here, one cut here, one cut here. So there's many, 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 many frames here. So your frame rate is very, very high. When you start doing angle corrections with the machine, you lose this frame, this high frame rate. You lose this information. So that's why it's better to try to angle yourself as best as you can, rather than to use these kind of angle correction maneuvers. We use the MO to calculate something called the fractional of shortening of the left ventricle, which is basically this left ventricular and diastolic diameter minus the left ventricular and systolic diameter divided by the left ventricular and diastolic diameter times 100 to provide you a shortening fraction. You can do this in the two views, and it's a marker of left ventricular systolic function. The American Society of Echo in the adult and pediatric world actually recommend that we don't use the M mode and that we use the B mode to calculate these things. So a lot of the literature in the adult and pediatric world are starting to use the B mode for that, okay? This is a GE image, and I just want to point out that in this particular older scan, there is a focus. So it's very important to adjust your focus when you do imaging. In the, in the Philips, you can see the focus is here. This is the focus. Typically, the focus in this particular view, you would have liked to drop it down because you want the focus to be on your left ventricle because most of the information you're getting for this actual M mode is on the left ventricle. So here, if I would criticize my own images, I would bring down the focus here, okay? And then here you can see that they rightly did, they've put the focus on the LV. This is an adult, that's why the heart rate is 50. And so, and you see they're really at the tip of the mitral valve. And you can see how if they would use the M mode versus if they use the 2D, it's not exactly the same cut. So that's why there's been a push and recommendation to use um, to use the, the brightness mode. Um, same thing, you need to know when is your venture, if you're using the 2D, you need to be good at like, when is my peak of my, or my end of diastole, when is my end of systole, right? Here you are on your QRS. So you know you're at the end of your diastole. The ventricle, the, the um, the aortic valve is closed, right? So you're still at the end of your diastole. You don't wanna be starting to measure when your valve is open because it means that you started your systole. So when you're using 2D, you need to prime your mind about what are the markers I'm getting that I wanna measure. I wanna measure my end of diastole. So I'm gonna go on my QRS and I'm gonna do this measurement. If I would criticize this image quality acquisition wise, you can see here, there's a lot of brightness I would have adjusted my 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 LGC to to decrease the amount of gain specifically in that area so that I can see better in my posterior wall. 
because here I have difficulty seeing sharply my posterior wall. So it's important also sometimes to adjust your gain segmentally in order to have, you know, better visualization of structure. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to be aware on the Neocardial Lab website, there is a section both on normative data, which brings you to a lot of the banks of normative data. One of them is the Boston Children Bank, which has a lot of Z core calculators based on their Equilab there. There's also Parameter Z, which is excellent. This is a, they have two sites and it's banks of Z core calculation. And they include banks of Z core calculation for M modes of the left ventricle. So for the mass, for example, to tell you if there's hypertrophy or not. There's also a section here on left ventricular function, which provides you information on some of the metrics that we use and the references in neonatology. So for example, if you are measuring shortening fraction, there's different ways of saying, oh, this is normal versus this is abnormal. So I put one reference where it tells you that, you know, if you're between 28 and 46%, you're probably in a normal range, right? But as you know, everything is a distribution. For some patient, you're gonna be at 28% of shortening fraction, it's gonna be normal. And for some other, it might be a bit abnormal. And if you had like three other scan in the last three days, they were always at 35% and now they're at 28 because they started deteriorating. So, you, so it's important to take this into the clinical context of where you are with your patient if you're, if you're using these metrics, okay? There's many of the, so I invite you to read this section on left ventricular function if you haven't, because it provides you a lot of information on some of the functional metrics that we do for the LV. And, it, and it's linked up to some of, you know, then you can go and you can actually go, you know, I've put a reference for end systolic wall stress, which talks about, you know, some markers. So, so you're able to take advantage of that. Okay, let me go back. So we will typically take a zoom of the left ventricular outflow track. So here you have the leaflet of your aortic valve and you can see it in motion. And it's very important that we see things in motion. And then from here, you're able to measure what we call the LV outflow track, which is gonna be at the hinge point of the attachment of the valve. So hinge point is where the valves attach at the LVOT. And so you can measure this and it's important to measure it in order to eventually calculate your cardiac output or estimate your cardiac output. This is from American Society of Echo. It shows you how to measure the ascending aorta parameters. So it, it tells you there's a right pulmonary artery. This is the left ventricular outflow tract. So we would measure our LVOT at the hinge point. So you can see the hinge point is here and it's here. And then you get your, your science of, of Azalva. So you get your aortic root your sinotubular junction, which is that zone where it becomes more narrow, and eventually you get your ascending aorta. Very important to see that here, ASC has standardized that you measure these things when the valve is open, so at the peak of systole, when there is ejection. It's not when the valve is closed. That's the standard for this particular recommendation by the ASC. Now, there are papers that will do the measurements when the valve is closed. So it's important when you're doing measurements and you're comparing yourself to other papers or other cohorts and describing your cohorts to make sure the way they measured it is the same way that you measured it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other thing that's important is again, alignment. You remember how I told you that the aortic valve is typically trileaflet? Well, the way you cut it, depending on where you are in 2D, you can see that it's very different. So first of all, it's not a perfect circle, right? It's more of like, it looks like a flower, almost like a triangle. So it's not a perfect circle. So when we're assuming it's a circle, we're aware that there is a geometrical assumption that's not completely true because we typically will use the diameter that we measured here and we'll use this diameter to calculate a surface area. So the cross-sectional area of the left ventricular output track. That's what we're gonna be using to calculate the left ventricular output. And you can see that depending on where you're doing your 2D cut, the image you're gonna get is gonna be very different, right? So if you're cutting here versus if you're cutting there versus if you're cutting here, 
It's not going to be the same cut that you're going to see. And then, um, and then, and then you can see like obviously angulation may have an impact on how you're going to measure. So this this cross sectional area and why it's so important to be as precise as as consistent as possible is that this is going to be um, to the ex exponent three. It's going to be to you know three times multiplied. So so if you have only like you know a micromillimeter difference. It's going to be like really, you know, exponentiated in terms of your calculation. The next uh, M mode that we typically give uh, get in this view is the M mode um, that's going through the aorta and then eventually through the left ventricle, uh, the left atrium, and that allows you to measure what we call the. Um, um, the aor the left atrium on uh, aorta ratio, which is a marker of left atrial dilatation. But don't forget, each time you have a ratio, if the ratio is large, it means that either your left atrium is big or that your aorta is small or a mix of both. So sometimes you're going to have a very big LA on aorta ratio in patients with like, for example, coarctation or hypoplastic arch. So you have to be aware of that. If your aorta is tiny, your your ratio is going to be high. Okay. Now I see a lot of people often asking me like, oh well, um, what's the right way of doing the LA on the aorta ratio? Um, in terms of uh, how do we do the measurements? And so the initial measurement was actually described by someone called Norman Sil Silverman which is a wonderful cardiologist who did a lot of research in ECHO. And the initial measurement was done that way. So this is the original paper from ECHO assessment of ductus arteriosus shunned in premature infants. And you can see that they've done the measurements in different ways, okay? Um, but you can see that the initial measurement was done so that it's, aortic valve here. And if you follow this tracing, you can see the LA, LA. It's exactly when the LA is the largest, it's here, right? This is the same as here. So it's it's like aorta at the closure of the valve. So this is closure of the valve. And then the valve is closed. And then the valve opens. Does that make sense? You can see kind of the leaflet of the valve closing here and like kind of like the junction of these leaflets is here. And then you can see that junction move in time and then it reopens. So the aortic valve is closed in ventricular diastole, right? The aortic valve is closed in ventricular diastole. And typically, typically the, um, when the ventricle, when the aortic valve initially closes, it means that the left ventricle has just finished emptying. Does that make sense to you? So let me go back to this. It might be clear. So you have the leaflet of the aortic valve the aortic valve leaflet will close. They stay closed, close, 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 close. QRS happen, ventricle starts contracting, boom. There's gonna be ejection, the aortic valve will open. Is it clear? Yeah. Yeah. So when, just before disclosure, it means that the ventricle has completely, or has emptied, it's the peak, it's the end of the systole. During ventricular systole, the left atrium is facing a closed mitral valve, right? It makes sense. Because the ventricle is emptying, the mitral valve is closed. Because the mitral valve is closed, the left atrium is still getting filled by pulmonary venous flow, but it has nowhere to empty, right? It's like a bag that's closed. It's getting filled by the pulmonary venous flow, but the mitral valve is, is, is not allowing the left atrium to empty itself. So during the ventricular systole, that's the time 
where the left atrium is the biggest. It's the largest. It contains the most amount of volume. So it makes sense to quantify left atrial diameter during that portion of the cardiac cycle. That's the reason why we do things like this. Now, you will see some papers that will measure the aortic valve diameter actually at the end. So at the end of the ventricular diastole here, just before you get your QRS, okay? Now, locally, we do LA like this and aorta like this. And the reason I've been doing this it's first of all, one of our, our echo lab does it like that. Number one, number two, that's how it's originally been described by Norman Silverman. Number three, it's, there's been studies since then. And they showed that, that you measure either that you measure here uh, or that you measure it there. The aortic valve doesn't change that much in terms of diameter and the, and the corresponding ratio are the same basically. So it pretty much doesn't make a big difference, but I wanted to explain why you might see some differences in the literature. Okay, it's important to know that. So, and you can see here, that's how they've done, that's how they've done it. <clears throat> and really, if you would measure, the initial literature has done it from edge to edge and from edge to edge. So you shouldn't really include the walls. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. Okay. So this is a sweep. So first it's going posterior and then it's going on anterior. So LV central view, posterior RV RA, and then eventually you see the pulmonary, the RV alpha tract pulmonary valve. So this is the pulmonary valve main pulmonary artery and RV alpha tract. It's a great view to do a few things. Get color over the valve. Make sure your valve is opening and closing. Measure your RV alpha tract at the hinge point of the valve. Again, it's the hinge point that you want to measure. You can see if there's pulmonary insufficiency here. You can get a gradient through the RVOT so you're able to see if there's signs of pulmonary valvular stenosis. Um, and so, it, you're well aligned and um, in pulmonary insufficiency, you're also very typically well aligned in this view. So this is to contrast how the aortic valve and the LVOT versus the pulmonary valve and the RVOT looks like. Typically the RVOT will be bigger in diameter than the LVOT, just so you're aware which is important and has some consideration for congenital heart defect when you're gonna start considering using the RVO, the pulmonary valve as a replacement of your aortic valve. But for TNE, it's, it's just, it's a non-technical consideration, okay? This is a, actually a Phillips image, okay? You can see that this is one centimeter, this is two centimeter. You can see it here, okay? This particular patient is not hooked up to ECG, so the machine is not able to tell you what's the heart rate. You get your frame rate in terms of Hertz. So because we're zoomed on the valve, you get a very high temporal resolution, 198 frame per second. This tells you you're using the S12 probe, okay, which is a neonatal probe. It's 12 megahertz. This tells you you're in 2D mode or B mode. And it provides you information about how much gain you have. So right now the echo is at 66% of gain and your compression is at 48. So there's something called compression and well, we'll be scanning. It's like, you know, it's very rare we play the compression, but you typically will change your compression to see better like structures like coronaries. And then on the bottom, it's the type of um, megahertz you're gonna use for your probe. So R means resolution. G is for general, and P is for uh, how profound you are, so the depth, okay? So when you're in the Philips system, if you're going towards more of a resolution, it's going to, it's going to use the much higher frequencies of the probe because it's going, to be, it's going to be using like very superficial structure and it's going to give you more resolution, but you're losing in depth. 
So in some of your probes and your machine, you're also able to control the actual range of hertz you're gonna be using of your probe. The other thing that this image provides you here is the information of how deep you are in your cut. So this image is going up to four centimeters. Okay, all this information has meaning. So it's important you guys know when you're scanning, what are these information telling you? So we're still in the RV outflow track in the power external long axis. Here I have my color box. Here I see my um, focus, where it is. And here I have my velocity filter. I have my Nyquist. We call this sometimes Nyquist. What is velocity filter? The velocity filter, first of all, tells you, well, I'm at an equal baseline between the blood flow coming towards the probe and the blood flow going away from the probe, which is always what we want. And sometimes people will start playing with the baseline and that's, you know, you have to be careful and when you're looking, if the image looks odd, it's maybe something, someone by mistake changed the baseline, okay? Red by convention is typically towards the probe, blue is away from the probe. And the color will be a graphic representation of the speed that the machine is providing. So this number tells you everything that is below this velocity will be filtered out. So if there's blood flow going at 30 centimeters per second, the machine will not show it to you. If there's blood flow going at 50 centimeters per second, the machine will not show it to you. If there's blood flow at 70 centimeters per second, the machine will show it to you. Here, higher velocity filter. We chose to filter out much higher at a much, much higher cut point. So the more you have high velocity structure, typically the highest you want your Nyquist or velocity filter. And on the contrary, if you have a structure with low velocity blood flow, you want to decrease your Nyquist to see the blood flow. For, for example, pulmonary veins, coronary arteries, um, because the coronary artery blood flow is typically in diastole, so it's a low velocity flow. Uh, SVC. But I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm doing the SVC and I have a vein of gallon malformation and I have torrential blood flow coming back. Typically, this torrential blood flow is coming back at a higher velocity. Why? Because it's trying to fit through a structure that is narrow. So it's gonna go faster, the blood flow. So you're gonna see a lot of turbulence appear by color and to avoid seeing all this turbulence, you're gonna increase your velocity filter to get some of that information. And why? Because turbulence will create something called aliasing. Aliasing is when the machine has difficulty um, or the machine may not picture which direction the blood flow is going because there's micro turbulence where some blood flow is coming towards the probe, some blood flow is going away from the probe. And so at the same localized area, there's different velocities that are going in different directionality because of these different kind of um, swirling effect. So think of the blood like being ejected through a turbulent pa path. What's gonna happen, it's gonna start swirling. It's gonna start turning like a snowball. So then you're gonna have blood flow coming towards you, going away from you. So in order to really clean out what's the average directionality of your blood flow, sometimes you need to increase this velocity filter or decrease the velocity filter if you, if you have very low velocity structure. Make sense? Okay. So here we're doing an RVOT view. We wanna see the blood originating before the valve and going through the valve. Okay, if not, you may miss pulmonary valve atresia, especially if there's blood flow coming back from the PDA and swirling, okay? And then you want to take a CW, a continual wave Doppler, which provides you information along the interline of interrogation, and you wanna take a pulse wave Doppler too. This is a representation of a pulse wave Doppler, PW. Pulse wave Doppler tells you you get velocity estimation at exactly where you're sampling your velocities. So my line of interrogation is here. I'm sampling here. This is gonna give me time where you see QRS here. So the time axis is here. And this is gonna give me the velocities. So you see centimeters per second. This is the velocities that are coming towards the probe. This is the velocities that are going 
away from the probe. And so because blood flow is going from the RVOT to the pulmonary artery, it's blue. And because it's going away from the probe, it's by convention negative. And you see blue by convention is negative velocity, red by convention is towards the probe and they're positive velocities. And that's just convention. We decided this to speak the same language. CW is gonna be also important because it provides you information about the velocities all along the line of interrogation. So not at a specific point, but all along the line of interrogation. Important for higher velocity structures, important when you think that there's acceleration because for example, there's a blockage, there's turbulence, there's a stenosis. Important when you wanna assess, for example, things like insufficiencies, pulmonary insufficiency, mitral valve, tricuspid valve insufficiency, if you're measuring DPDT or TR. Uh, if you have aortic stenosis, if you have a PDA sometimes at high velocity, you may need to take a continuous wave Doppler. Pulse wave Doppler are also good to assess. So output, they're important to assess pulmonary veins or SVC uh, velocities. Uh, so anything that's a venous or low velocity flow. Um, and they're also important sometimes. So for example, if you have a VSV that is very large, and there's rapid equalization of pressure during systole, well, the velocities of flow are gonna be very low because it's very rapid, the actual equalization. So you're gonna use a PW often during this context. Same thing for a PDA that's very large and there's rapid equalization, you're gonna use a pulse wave Doppler, okay? And when we're gonna be calculating the cardiac output, we're gonna be doing this area under the curve. And I'll explain a bit more when we get there. So this is a view where we see the blood flow originate below, before the pulmonary valve, go through the pulmonary valve, and then feed in some of the pulmonary arteries, actually. And we even see a bit of a trace of a PDA, this little flame, which means there's blood flow coming towards the probe. OK, this is an action. So you see the pulmonary valve, RVOT, main pulmonary artery, and blood flow originating before the valve, going through the valve. Very important to actually see what's happening before and seeing flow through the valve. Okay. We like to have this cursor actually on the valve. Now, because there's movement of the valve, we probably positioned it at the opening of the outflow track and then during you know the actual acquisition, the valve closed and there was a bit of a motion of the valve, but this cursor should be on the RVOT or on the LVOT. It shouldn't be in the main pulmonary artery. It should be actually just before the valve. It should just be here to calculate output, okay? So QRS, you get, and these are velocities, it's a speed. You get the time here. So you get an acceleration of blood flow and a deceleration of blood flow. And eventually, systole is finished. Ejection, I should say, is finished. And then you get movement of your valve because you get a bit of a motion of the valve that's coming towards the probe because the valve is coming back towards the RVOT. And then you get ventricular filling or diastole, and then it restarts, QRS, and then boom. So the R to R will typically represent the distance between the beginning of your systole, of your ejection, I should say, to the next ejection. And then this time point, this timing, represents your ejection time. And then we'll, we'll go through more of that when I do parasternal short axis. So that's just parasternal long axis. And there's more you could measure, but you know we'll, we'll stick to the basics. Parasternal short axis, because in this view, we can also measure the, the tricuspid valve, okay? The tricuspid valve can be measured, oops. That's not the view. Is it this one? Yeah. So you could measure the tricuspid valve 
here at its hinge point. So there's some literature measuring the tricuspid valve here when it's open to get an assessment of the inflow of the right ventricle, which informs you on dilatation of the RV also. Okay, parasternal short axis view. So here you can see we're doing a 90 degree from the parasternal long axis. And in this view, we're gonna go from the aortic valve up to the apex and get different cuts. So in this view, you'll see now the whole anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the whole posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And you're gonna see the two papillary muscle typically, one of which, which is the posterior medial papillary muscle and the anterior lateral papillary muscle. So anterior lateral, it makes sense. It's the lateral and it's anterior. The other one is more posterior compared to this one and it's more medial. So we call it the posterior medial. It also provides you an assessment from top to bottom, so from cranial to caudal, of the whole wall of the LV. So it's an excellent view to get an assessment of the ventricular function from the moment of the mitral valve to the apex. And you can see, like, is my wall functioning well here? Is it functioning well here? And sometimes I actually hide on the screen just to see. Like I go and I hide the different portion of my wall as I'm re-looking at my images to see, well, are certain portions not working well? Like is the apex not working well, things like that. So these are the different cuts. You're gonna have you know, this as your reference. And you can see that as we're getting more cranial, you see your aortic valve, your RA, LA, pulmonary artery, and the RVOT and the part of the right ventricle. And then eventually you're going down, you start seeing your coronaries and eventually, um, oh, sorry, this is more, you're getting more uh, cranial. Um, but here you're seeing more your mitral valve and your RV, and then eventually you see more of your papillary muscle. And, and, and you know, that's a view where you can see the PDA also sometimes, but really the PDA has a specific view, which is much more cranial and much more typically to the left. Sometimes it's even in the suprasternal area to see the PDA. So in this view, we see the trileaflet aortic valve. So this is typically the right coronary cuts because the right coronary is here, the left coronary cuts because the left coronary is here, and the non-coronary cuts because there's no coronary typically here. You see your pulmonary valve, you see your left atrium, which you can see is just posterior to your aortic valve. So when you're gonna do your LA on aorta, you can cut it through here. You can see sometimes a bit of your interatrial septum, but because you're in front of the interatrial septum, it's not great to see if there's like a PFO or not. But in adults, that's kind of sometimes the only view they get to see if there's a shunt or suspect a shunt. And that's a tricuspid valve. If you go a bit more cranially, you can see well your RVOT and, and pulmonary valve. You can see your main pulmonary artery. You can see your right pulmonary artery and your left pulmonary artery, which in babies is gonna often be more like curved like this instead of being more like a Y. And that's why they get this like peripheral pulmonary stenosis. It's because the pulmonary, the pulmonary arteries are more stretched like this instead of being more like this. So they get a bit of functional acceleration. And as they grow, these pulmonary arteries are gonna become more aligned. And that's why often they get a bit of a murmur of flow acceleration in the pulmonary artery. And we call this a benign murmur of peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. So sometimes we do just Doppler these to make sure that there's no signs of functional pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary artery stenosis. But if there's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put the color to make sure there's blood flow. If you, if you do just a pulse with Doppler, you're gonna see that there's acceleration because there's a bit of turbulence. What we see in this view is the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So you remember the parasternal long axis, we saw the anterior and the posterior. Here we're seeing the anterior and the septal leaflet because there's three leaflets. Now we're going down. We can see the septum, we can see the posterior wall, we can see the anterior uh, leaflet of the mitral valve, the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and you can see nicely the opening and closing. And sometimes you can even see in motion the, 
the A and then the E, sorry, the E and then the A. So the early phase of diastole and then the reopening of the mitral valve during the atrial kick. So sometimes you can even appreciate it when there's low heart rate, these kind of double motion of the mitral valve. And as you go down, then you see the papillary muscle and eventually you get to your apex. So this uh, isn't a kid, this isn't a baby. We see here the right corner artery that's branching from your um, just above your LVOT and your aortic valve. And you can see here in color, the red flow in diastole, which corresponds to the left coronary artery, which is low velocity. That's why the Nyquist is so low, right? You can see here how low it is. It's like 19 centimeters per second, 0 0.19 meters per second. We can, it's important if you're looking at coronaries to see it in motion because you want to see it enter because you, you can sometimes mix epicardial folds for a coronary artery, but here we can very nicely see the coronary artery. And as I'm putting color, I can see that there's actually blood flow in it. You can see here the blood flow. Yes. Perfect. And that's during diastole. You can see it just before the QRS. And I know that's where, you know, at QRS, you're at your end of diastole. So it's, it's when you get coronary blood flow. Harder to get the coronary blood flow because you're, you're kind of in front of it when you're doing the images. So it's harder to get it by, by color for the right coronary artery. So now it's important to see the valve in motion to make sure that it has three leaflets and that the three leaflets are opening. Why? Because the majority of bicuspid aortic valves are gonna be tri-leaflets with fusion of the non-coronary and one of the coronary cusp. So you may see that it's three cusps, but actually here I can see that these three cusps are well open versus if you just show like this, I see there's three cusps, but I don't know if some of them are fused and they just open as a bicuspid valve because most bicuspid valves are functionally bicuspid, but they're anatomically with three leaflets. It's just there's two leaflets that are stuck together. So like this, you're not proving to me that this is not a bicuspid. And why is it important to not miss bicuspid is that they can develop aortic stenosis. What is this structure? Do you guys know? Descending aorta. Exactly. Fantastic. Okay. So the same way you're getting uh, Elion aorta ratio from the parasternal long axis, you can get it from the parasternal short axis. And you can see here that it was measured from edge to edge, and it was measured at the closure of the aortic valve. And here, just before the opening of the aortic valve. We typically will measure it that way. And I can tell you there's studies that have been done and it doesn't make a, a difference, the, the two technique. And you can see that the LA is being measured from the wall of the left atrium to the wall of the left atrium. And you can see the left atrium here. And then the ratio is this diameter divided by this diameter. So the LA diameter, which is 1.65 here, to the aortic diameter, which is 0 0.92, and it gives you an LA on aorta of, I think, 1.8. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Then pulmonary valve, same thing. You have the pulmonary valve closed here, pulmonary valve open here, and then you can measure at the hinge point. So where the pulmonary valve is attached to the RVOT, and then you can measure here, the RVOT outflow track, okay? The VTI, so here I'm, my RVOT is here. I'm just at the valve or just below the valve. And I do a pulse wave Doppler, which tells me the instantaneous speed or velocity exactly where I'm asking to measure it. And then here I do a tracing on my ejection which provides me with some of these information. The first thing is a velocity time integral. What's a velocity time integral? It, this is what it says. It's a velocity time integral. Integral meaning that I'm doing 
the average, the area under the curve. So this is, if I take one velocity, second velocity, third velocity, four velocity, and I, I do the summation of that. So, so zero plus one plus two. So you see the velocities are here, like 20, 40, 60, 80. So this is like zero meter centimeters per second. Then I get like five centimeters per second. Then I get like 10 centimeters per second, blah, blah, blah. Then I get to like about 60 centimeters per second. And, and I take the sum of all of that, but multiplying each time by the time. So this is like 0.1 second, 0.1 second, 0.1 second, 0.1 second. And so if you do a velocity times a time, times a time, it gives you a distance. And if you do the addition of everything, it gives you the overall distance, and then you, you take the average of that, and then the average is, an, is expressed in a distance. Make sense? So the velocity time integral, which is the area under this curve, provides you the average distance that is actually traveled by the blood flow that you exactly sampled here. So that's why we call this a stroke distance. And if you multiply this by the heart rate at the time of your measurement, it gives you a minute distance. And if you multiply your minute distance by an area of outflow track, you're gonna get an output estimate. So that's how you get your estimation of output. So how do we measure the heart rate? Well, you can measure it from an R to R at the beats that you did your measurements of the stroke distance, or you can you know, measure from one one beginning of ejection to the next beginning of ejection because it provides you, or from the closure of the valve to the closure of the valve. It's gonna give you the heart rate of that particular beat. I, I like to use the QRS, but you know, the, the, all of these techniques are, are giving you pretty much the same heart rate. The other thing that you can measure is the time that it takes for the entire ejection, which is from the beginning to the end of the ejection. This is the closure of the valve. This, this line is the closure of the valve. And you can measure the tip of acceleration, which is here, okay? Boom to, to boom, to the peak of acceleration. So the peak of acceleration being this thing here, right? This is the peak. So you can go from here to your peak of acceleration and you can measure from here to here to get your ejection time. So here, the ejection time is 200, nine milliseconds it's all these things so number three in blue and then your acceleration is number two which is 77 milliseconds and then you can do the ratio of your acceleration time to your rv ejection time which has been a marker that we use sometimes to assess rv afterload it is influenced by many things it's influenced by pvr it's influenced also by other types of increase of afterload so let's say you have pulmonary embolus it's gonna also change the shape of this um, of this Doppler. If you have a big PDA with a lot of flow coming from the aorta to your pulmonary artery, it's also gonna change because your RV afterload is gonna increase. It's gonna be exposed to the aortic pressure, right? Because you're connecting your pulmonary artery to the aorta. So if you have a big PDA, you're gonna get a lot of pressure transmission and your RV is going to have higher afterload than expected, it's also going to change this shape, okay? So the pulse wave Doppler indicates pulmonary arterial flow velocity profile. It's usually a parabolic smooth acceleration and deceleration when you're in a normal context where the PPR are very low. And as you increase your afterload, you're going to start seeing shorter acceleration. So we in neonatology and pediatric will have a tendency to adjust it to the ejection time because they typically will have very fast heart rates. Um, but in adults, you're gonna see that they just measure the pulmonary acceleration time. Okay. Uh, but we normalize it to the ejection time because we need to take into account the heart rate, which can also change the shape of the Doppler inflow. So if you have a very fast heart rate, the ventricular systole is very fast, right? So this shape may change also because of that. And that's why we adjusted to the ejection time. So most of the literature shows that, you know, unless you have a big PDA present or you have a pulmonary embolus or an obstruction or a pulmonary artery stenosis or things like that, 
Um, your RV, your PAT on RVT less than 0.25 is suggestive of pulmonary vascular disease. There's even some authors that are more lenient and they use 0.3, but most of the literature in the TNE guidelines actually recommend to use 0.25. And if you're doing the inverse, it's uh, if you're doing this, the ratio like RVT on PAT, then it's four, the cutout. It's just like you change the denominator and the numerator. And then sometimes you get something called a mid systolic notch. So this is the parabolic. So you can see you get the ejection time, you get your acceleration from the beginning of the ejection time to the peak of acceleration. And this is going to be a very smooth acceleration and smooth deceleration in normal context. But as you're getting increasing afterload, you're going to get a shorter acceleration and then a longer deceleration. And sometimes you get even what we call this mid-systolic notching. Do you know what this mid-systolic notching? Why do you get this notching? Because it's due to the recoil of the... Um... Exactly. It means that, you know, the, the pulmonary artery uh, to a certain degree, unless it becomes very, very stiff, is elastic tissue. So if it's facing a very high afterload distally and your RV starts to eject, this elasticity will have a certain capacitance. It will accumulate blood and then eventually redo another, you know, to a certain degree and there's a recoil. So it creates these two velocities. So that's a sign that there's very high afterload. So that's an example of ejection time on RV on, on acceleration time. Here, I'm going to criticize myself. This is way too far into the pulmonary artery. This needs to be much closer to the valve, like here. This is pretty good. Here, I get a very short acceleration, and you can see the ejection. So this is very concerning for high RVOT afterload, high RV afterload. Okay. Another example, very smooth. Actually, that's very nice. It's at the valve or just below the valve. Same thing here, the valve below the valve. And then here you can actually see the mid-systolic notching. So you get initial acceleration, deceleration, the recoil, and then the final deceleration. And you can see here that my PAT, my acceleration time is very short compared to my ejection time, compared to this one where the peak of acceleration is actually here. It's like at the middle of my, so that's probably, you know, 0.5. Make sense? Again? Uh, yeah. Tell me, Pacini. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, I, saw yeah. in the a I saw in the ASE for the level to measure the uh, PAT and RVT. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, say that for the VTI, uh, the level for the the cursor is in the at the inlet, but it's a uh, but if at the outlet the, at the outflow track. Yeah, but for the um PAT or RVT is just at the tip of the mitral, of the distance? pulmonary valve. Yeah. Yeah. So the literature is a bit controversial on that. Um. So there's different papers looking at this where you get your. At the RVOT, you get your, um, for the Doppler, for the output. And then some centers and some papers have done it that the actual acceleration time on RV ejection time is actually in the pulmonary artery. So that's just an example of why we've done it here in the pulmonary artery, right? Because it is called pulmonary arterial acceleration time. But I'll be honest with you, many centers, they do it on the same Doppler envelope. Okay. So um, it's just recently that the TNE guidelines has recommended to do those sampling, one sampling at the um, RVOT and one sampling at the pulmonary artery. So we may start doing that, but you're going to see that in a lot of our scans that we've done at Neocardio Lab, we've done a few samplings and most of the time at the level of where we do the cardiac output. But that's important. It's it's how you describe it in your paper when you're going to be measuring. And what's important is always to be consistent. But yes, it's true that if you look at adult guidelines who have the most amount of data on the use of acceleration time, they've done it inside the pulmonary artery at the tip of the at the tip of the uh, pulmonary valve. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. For the normal value of the PAT and RBET ratio, if in yeah. the normal, it should be it should be more than 0.25? Or... Yeah. So it's abnormal if it's less than 0.25. It's normal, oh, okay. it's more than 0. 0.3. But between 0. 0.25 and 0. 0.3, there is a bit of a blur. Some babies it's normal, mm -hmm. some babies it's a bit of a concern. Because you can have 0. 0.28 and I would still be a bit concerned. I would not call it completely normal. Do you see what I'm, because it's a distribution, right? There's fringes. But if it's less than 0. 0.25, you can definitely call it mm -hmm. concerning and abnormal. And okay. if the for the PVRI, uh, the normal is more than four, right? Yeah, so it's the same ratio. It's the same ratio. It's just you inverse it. Convert, yeah. You convert it. So more than four is abnormal. Abnormal, okay. Abnormal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's an example of VTI when you have PDA contamination. So here you have a PDA, so it contaminates the Doppler. So you want to try to really have your Doppler below the valve to avoid getting too much contamination and to be able to see your spectral envelope. This is when we do a continuous wave Doppler. Continuous wave Doppler, you're able to get the thick peak systolic velocity at the level of your RV MPA, RVOT MPA. And you're also sometimes able to get pulmonary insufficiency velocities. So these are the velocities in meters per second. And you can see that the peak of the pulmonary insufficiency is number one here, 2.85 milliseconds. And you can even calculate 2.85 milliseconds. Okay. And then the end, uh, the end of the pulmonary insufficiency jet is at 2.14. And if you use the Bernoulli equation, which is 4V square, you can translate that into a gradient of pressure. In this context, the gradient of pressure is from the main pulmonary artery to the RVOT. So it tells you that there is a peak diastolic, sorry, there is, there is a peak pulmonary insufficiency of 33 of gradient, and there is an end of 19. Okay, and because this happens in diastole, it informs you on the gradient in diastole. So the pulmonary valve is closed in diastole. If you get sometimes pulmonary hypertension, your RV and your PA will start dilating. So you may start seeing this pulmonary insufficiency jet. Although I'm gonna be honest with you, the pulmonary valve is a very good valve. So it's often not seeing the pulmonary insufficiency jet. Only about like 15 to 20% of scans that you're going to get some trace pulmonary insufficiency jet. So, but if you have pulmonary hypertension, sometimes it's going to start to appear. The early insufficiency jet, so the first phase of the insufficiency jet, informs you on the mean pulmonary arterial pressure, and the end informs you on the diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure. And that's the equation. That's the reference. If you want to go read it, it's a very good article. Um, from the team of Denver, actually. They have a lot of experience in pulmonary hypertension. So the diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure is using the Bernoulli equation, which is your 4V square. So you use your end, which the end is here, number two, 2.88. So you get 33 millimeters of mercury of gradient. And you add your RE pressure, which your RE pressure is about five. Why the RE pressure? Is that because in diastole, your tricuspid valve is open. And so your RE and your RV will equalize pressure. And then we assume that the RE pressure is around zero to five, which is probably not true when you have pulmonary hypertension and you have diastolic dysfunction, your RE pressure starts increasing. But it informs you on your, on your, on your um, diastolic pressure in your pulmonary artery. So... To have 47, it's very, very high. To have 33, it's very, very high. Why? Because we told you after three months of life, you, you should be below 20 in the pulmonary artery in terms of mean pulmonary arterial pressure. And your diastolic pressure is always going to be lower than your mean. So if you already have a diastolic pressure of 25, for sure your mean is higher than that. Does that make sense? Is it clear for you guys? Perfect. So you can get your um, 
your pulmonary insufficiency jet. The TNE guideline, so RA pressure estimated 5 million rates of mercury, they use the one third to two thirds. So you remember our last teaching, we spoke about how you assess mean pressures and we use the one third to two thirds sometimes estimate because you spend a third of your time in systole and two thirds of your time in diastole. But really a mean blood pressure is an area under the curve, right? That's the mean pressure. It's not, it's not like the one third to two thirds. So you have to be careful about this way of estimating mean pulmonary arterial pressure. If you only have one point, I would not be able to estimate that. And I think that personally, I recommend more the technique that's recommended by Jones, which is this technique, which is taking the early. If you have a full curve, I would take the early and use that as the estimation of the mean pulmonary arterial pressure. Okay, so basically I would take this velocity and then use that as the MPA to RV gradient and add my five millimeters of mercury. Okay, we're going down into the parasternal short axis view. This time you have your RV on top, you have your LV, you have your anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflet, your mitral valve opening. And you can see that um, you can go as you're scanning down to the tip to get also your M mode. And then you can um, eventually, you know, do the same thing as we did for the parasternal long axis view. We can even see nicely the E separation point here. Same caveats, discouraged by the ASE, angle dependent, et cetera, et cetera. This is a view at the mid papillary level view. This view is very important because this is the view that's been validated for the assessment of the um, septal, the interventricular septal wall motion. Very important that you can create a very flat septum when you're scanning if you're too low on your chest and you're closer to the apex. To the apex. So very important, actually in babies, the parasternal short axis is very high, very, very high. You remember Fassini when you're scanning, sometimes I'm telling you, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up because the view is from very high up in babies. And you really, what you want to see, you, want to, you don't want to see any atrium. Here, you want to see only the RV, only the LV in order to assess your septal wall motion. So it's in this view that we're going to measure eccentricity index. It's in this view that we're going to measure 5-6 bullet shape ejection fraction. And I'll speak about the 5-6 ejection fraction very soon. It's in this view that you assess a lot of the contractile power of the left ventricle and that you can see the interventricular septal motion. Okay, so we know that, you know, assessing the, the septal motion can be very subjective because, you know, it's, it's not something that's quantified. It's something that's like subjective and appreciated visually. I think it's still important to have your eyes trained as you're gonna do more and more scan to recognize when there's like this V shape or when you, do, you have flattening or bowing of the septum. Here, I think it's even bowing. I think it's even going inside the LV cavity and in, in systole. You can see it's like going almost like this. So it's compressing a bit your left ventricle. So bowing means that the septum is going towards the LV. And don't forget when you're assessing the interventricular dependency, you have to know what's happening on the RV side and the LV side. So if the LV is hypotensive, you could still see that kind of thing, okay? So this is a sweep from the mitral valve up to the apex. Very important to see the apical, uh, the apical function. Remember that the, when the ventricle is contracting, it has this distortional aspect to it it contracts towards the inside and it has a bit of a longitudinal contraction. And typically it's gonna be a motion from the base of the ventricle to the apex. But the apex is very contractile. It's a very contractile portion of the ventricle. So it's important to go up to the apex to make sure that it functions well. And also it's very important when you're gonna put some color box here, for assessing a VSD presence that you go up to the apex because there's many VSDs that are at the apex and you could miss it if you don't go to the apex. This is the view at the mid papillary level. So we have the posterior medial and the anterolateral um, uh, uh, papillary muscle. These are different examples of 
septal flattening. This one is terrible. You can see that this RV is extremely hypertrophied. There's septal hypertrophy. And the LV is actually pancake. Look in systole. The cavity is almost obliterated. Right? You see that? Yes? Yep. So it's important when you assess for signs of pulmonary hypertension or RV, LV interdependency. And one of the worst signs that you can see in babies with or kids with pulmonary hypertension when they, when they start developing pericardial effusion. That's a very ominous sign that things are going very, very bad. Okay. Um, other things about that, the ventricular septum, the, 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 the shape of the ventricular septum is assessed during which part of the cardiac cycle, systole and dias or diastole, typically. Systole, so you can assess it. It's a trick question. You can assess it in any part of the cardiac cycle if you wish. It's just going to give you different type of information. In systole, the valve, aortic valve, pulmonary valve are open, and the pressure in the RV equilibrate with the pressure in the RVOT. And then the pressure in the LV equilibrate with the pressure in the aorta. So that's when you get an estimate of the interventricular dependency and mostly the inter vascular network dependency. So if you want to assess the, the, the sign of high pulmonary pressure relative to systemic pressure, you want to do it in systole at the peak of contraction. If you're looking at assessing in diastole, it informs you on end diastolic pressure. So if you get septal flattening at the peak of diastole, when the ventricle are filled, it tells you that the pressure in diastole and the RV is as much as the pressure in diastole and the LV, which could be because the RV diastolic pressure are high. And we see that in situation where you have, for example, uh, oh, no, oh, diastolic no. volume overload. Exactly. So typically in patients um, that have, for example, vein of gallon or hepatic, yeah, it, ASD, exactly. You see that when they're bigger. So pediatric patients with ASD, they get RV volume overload and they'll get flattening in diastole of the septum. And typically, they're not going to have flattening in systole because it's very rare that you are in Eisenmenger, right? It's typically that, you know, it takes time to get that. So isolated septal flattening in diastole in pediatric is a sign that you have a big ASD shunt. But in neonates, you can see flattening of your septum in diastole when you have a big RV over volume overload. For example, if you have vein of gallon malformation or hepatic hemangiomas, right, that sends a lot of blood flow back to the right atrium and to the RV. The other thing you may see flattening of your septum, both in systole and diastole, when you start having RV diastolic dysfunction, RV hypertrophy and remodeling, RV dilatation, uh, RV failure. So the, L the RV is not able to eject completely in systole. And because of that, there's residual volume in the RV cavity during diastole. And so when the tricuspid valve are opening, it's trying to overfill the RV and it's not able because it's very filled already. So you can see flattening of the septum because those pressure are getting high. Make sense? Yep. Perfect. And so this flattening is obviously a continuum, okay? And that's why we like to use eccentricity index to, to kind of give a quantifiable measure. And so when we assess the septal motion or even PDA direction or VSD direction, it's always, to put into consideration the two side of the equation. What's happening on the right side? What's happening on the left side? What's happening in the RV or the pulmonary compartment? What's happening in the systemic compartment? So you could suspect, for example, a Boeing septum or right to left PDA shunt or right to left systolic VSD shunt if basically your right-sided pressure are higher than your left-sided pressure. So that could be because the right side is much, much higher than the left side, but it's the right that's abnormally high, but the left is also high, but it's just less than the RV. So you can be in systemic hypertension and have pulmonary hypertension, but your pulmonary hypertension is suprasystemic. You could also be abnormally high here with left side that's pressure normal. You can have right side abnormally high and left pressure that are abnormally low. You're very hypotensive, and on top of it, you have pulmonary hypertension. Your RV side could have normal pressure, but you have so much septic shock and so much vasodilatation that you're, basically your blood pressure in your system is so low 
that you're going to be in suprasystemic RV pressure. So think of a patient who has an equal sepsis, super vasoplegic, and then your LV pressure is 25 of systolic over eight of diastolic. Well, maybe your RV pressure is going to be much higher than that in a baby. And that's not because the RV pressure is abnormally high. It's just that the LV pressure is so low that you are like suprasystemic. So it's important you take this into consideration. Maybe both pressures are very low. They're abnormally low, but it's the right side that's still higher than the left side. So when you put all this, you always have to look, okay, what's happening in my system? So it's always good if you are scanning your baby and it's you know a complex physiological situation, go back to your drawing board. What's happening in my right atrium? What's happening in my left atrium? What's happening in my RV? What's happening in my LV? What's happening outside of the heart? What's happening in my lungs? What's happening in, where's my blood flow going? Okay, where's my oxygen? Okay, my oxygen in my preductal side, my postductal side, my blood pressure in each compartment. And then try to put the story together to really delineate the physiology so you know which treatment you're gonna do. Do I need to increase my SVR? Do I need to decrease my PVR? Do I need to increase my pulmonary blood flow? Do I need to increase my systemic blood flow? Do I need to increase both? Do I need to decrease them? So it's all these things. So I have too much pulmonary blood flow. My baby's on overcirculation. What can I do? Okay, well, maybe, you know, the CO2, why is the CO2 so low? We need to, you know, increase the CO2 to vasoconstrict lung. So, so decrease your ventilation in your baby. Why are you aiming like CO2 is at 32? Like, for example, in a PDA that's left to right. So it's like these things that you have to think about when you're assessing your physiology. Okay, um, eccentricity index, peaks of systole at the papillary muscle level. You want to measure the diameter that is the largest and parallel to the septum. And you wanna divide it by the ratio of the diameter that it's perpendicular to that. If you have a perfect circle, it's gonna be one. And the more you're gonna start having septal flattening and eventually septal bowing, this ratio is gonna start increasing. And that's why we say that abnormal is 1.3 and more. And that's based from studies, uh, that I'm, one study that I'm gonna show. The ratio of the RV diameter to the ratio of the LV diameter along the same axis informs you on as a marker of RV dilatation. Usually the RV is a crescent and it's very slim compared to the LV, which is a nice circle. So if you see this ratio, the D3 on the D2, okay, here, D3 on D2, this is gonna be much less than one because the RV is a very small ventricle in normal context when you have very low PVR. So this ratio, as it increases, provides you a quantifiable metric of RV dilatation. Okay, so that's an example where if you see my eccentricity index is going to be very, very high because you have a very small pancake LV compared to an RV. This is a baby with pulmonary hypertension secondary to BPD. Clearly is having some struggle here. And your RV is actually all this, the diameter. So it's like four times the size of the LV tells you there is a lot of RV dilatation. Now, clinically, personally, and subjectively, I don't need the marker to tell me there's RV dilatation and things are not going well because this is an extreme example. But when you're doing research, you need quantifiable measures. You need to be, you cannot just be subjective. Oh, it's dilated. What does that mean dilated? Who decided that this is dilated? So it's important to have metrics that are quantifiable to say the RV is bigger. This is the paper that was uh, published by the group of Dr. Whiteman in ECHO 2016, which tells you that they had quantifiable parameters of systolic function of um, RV systolic function that were abnormal in the kids that had the eccentricity index more or equal to 1.3. And that's one of the reasons why we're using this cutoff. Suri, are you still on the line? Yes, can you Perfect. hear me? Yes, is it okay that we continue? I know we have a meeting after. Is it okay that yeah, we continue? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, yeah, perfect. we should. <laughs> Thank you. Good. So here you can see 
an example where it's a very nice circle, capillary muscle parallel to the septum, perpendicular to the septum, and then perpendicular to the septum for the RV, and then same thing here. Apical view, everything clear for the two views, parasternal short, parasternal long? Perfect. Yes. Apical view, so apical view, you can also, you should uh, do a sweep also, both in 2D and color. And typically it's the anatomical representation that we use in pediatrics. So the right, the left atrium, the RV, the LV. You can see that uh, although I'm not very good at drawing, I've left a little portion here where you can see that the tricuspid valve is a bit more uh, 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 caudally displaced compared to the mitral valve. So you get a very small portion of what we call an atro to ventricular septum. So a little portion. And then some babies, they may have ESD there, like babies with trisomy 21 who have atrial ventricular septal defect. Um, well, actually, it's they don't get, they don't get the displacement. Forget it. It, it. There are some kids who have this these ventricular septal defect, and they may get like a shunt from the LV to the right atrium because of that. Um, and forget about what I said. ESD. It's it's a different uh, because they they don't have H, their atrial ventricular valves are completely different. They're on the same level, typically. So atrial ventricular valve and AVSDs are typically on the same level versus in the normal anatomy of the heart, you shouldn't have those atrial ventricular valves on the same level. You get a bit of a, 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 a um, caudal displacement. So here you see what? You see the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve and the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And you see the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Uh, you can see these papillary muscle, and you can see the attachments to the mitral valve. You can see the descending aorta, and you can see the right upper pulmonary vein sometimes. So these are the different cuts. As you know, you can rotate uh, your probe in order to also see the apical two chamber or the apical five chamber view. Uh, so these are the different cuts in the apical four chamber view. You can, when you go posteriorly, you can also see the coronary sinus that drains into your right atrium. You'll often see this coronary sinus quite dilated in patients who have RV diastolic dysfunction with high right atrial pressure. So example, in patients with HIE who have RV dysfunction and PPHN or acute pulmonary hypertension, often you'll see very well the coronary artery, then you'll see very well the coronary sinus because they have high right atrial pressure. And then sometimes on top of it, they have low diastolic systolic pressure. So then, you know, you can, anyways, you, you, you can see well your coronary uh, sinus if it's dilated. The other reason you may see a big coronary sinus are in situation where you have abnormal drainage to your coronary sinus. So sometimes you have, for example, left superior vena cava, and it's gonna drain in your coronary sinus or in patients with total anomalous pulmonary venous return, with drainage to the coronaries. So if you see a big coronary sinus, make sure you're not missing any of these things. A left as SVC or, or a, you know, um, total or a pulmonary, uh, abnormal pulmonary venous return. Um, okay. So the four chamber, two chamber view are quite important in order to calculate the ejection fraction, which allows you to estimate basically the ventricular volume of the LV. So these are nice representation that Patini put together for us. It's available here. And it even shows where to actually tilt and adjust the orientation of your probe. So the left ventricle is bullet shaped in its normal configuration. Um, it has also a kind of conical shape towards the apex. Um, the interventricular wall has fibers that are shared between the two ventricles. And you can see also the tricuspid valve, how it attaches is not exactly the same as the mitral valve. So the tricuspid valve has a septal attachment and the mitral valve never has septal attachment. Um, the LV typically has a smoother internal layer versus the RV has, if you remember Pessini, when we went to the lab with Dr. Bellon, it has this crisscross type of uh, arrangement at the level of its surface. Um, and then typically it has a fibrous continuity between the aortic valve and the mitral valve. So you can see this kind of fibrous continuity. The, the mitral valve is here and then the aortic valve is here. So it's like almost connected together versus the RV side, you don't get that. The, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve are completely uh, not touching each other. 
Um, so LV contract mostly circumferentially, so towards the inside with a torsion or kind of a ringing movement, like a towel that you're trying to uh, get the water out of it. There's a minor longitudinal contribution and typically the wall will get thicker during muscle contraction. Like if I'm trying to contract my bicep, it gets thicker during contraction and thinner when it's relaxing. And, and this radial properties, you start losing them when you get fibrosis of your wall. So like in ischemia or cardiomyopathies, dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can get changes in your radial thickening. Uh, and then you get different rotational axes depending on where you're looking at because there's different layers. So this is just a representation. I'm putting here the actual references that are very good that are showing that depending on the internal or outer layer of your myocardium, you're gonna get different types of rotational properties. So typically when we're doing echo, it's very, it's much harder to get a good resolution of the kind of myocardial layers. So we often will look at the level of the endocardium, which is where we get the, the best kind of uh, interface resolution with echocardiography. With certain types of MRI, you're get, you're, you can be able to visualize much more the internal layer of the muscle. So it's a bit um, more feasible to kind of quantify rotational mechanics of the LV using the MRI. But with, with echo, it's often going to be more of the sub, sub endocardium that you're going to be able to kind of quantify this using 3D echo. So it's very hard to do sub epicardium type of rotational analysis. Uh, and that's why often even uh, in our package on Tomtech, it won't even give you the option of measuring sub epicardial rotational analysis. So these are examples of rotation. This is like the classical example where you see the apical rotation and you see the basal rotation, which uh, you see here has a negative trend because negative and positive is just the actual um, um, the actual, if it's clockwise or counter or counterclockwise. Um, so in the context of sub endocardium, you can see that the base is counterclockwise and the apex is clockwise. So the apex being clockwise is a positive uh, rotation, which this is a rotation in degrees. So it's a degree, like on a circle, like you see the degrees. Um, and then the base will be negative because it's a counterclockwise rotation. Okay, this is just convention of how we describe it. Um, and um, you remember I told you that the apex contracts a lot versus the base has a tendency to be more fixed because why? The base is at the level of the mitral level, which is the mitral valve is a bit more of a fibrous structure. So it has less of these motion because it's more fixed inside the ventricle. The apex has a tendency to rotate a lot and that's why the degree of the apex is often much bigger in terms of degrees of rotation compared to the base, which is closer to zero. You can see here, it's probably minus eight, so it's probably minus six of rotation versus this is going to the 16th degrees of rotation. Does that make sense to you guys? This is more events mechanics. The RV contracts longitudinally. So a lot of the metrics that we use to try to quantify RV function are like representation of this RV contractional power. It typically has this type of peristaltic motion from the RV inflow to the RVOT. You can actually see it here where you can see the RV bouncing up and down. Typically the interventricular septum in systole will go toward RV cavity, which also participates to the shortening of the volume of the RV. And then this wall, which is the free wall, will have a tendency to go towards the interventricular septum. In the apical four-chamber view, what do we see? We see the RV lateral wall and we see the septal wall, which is not, these are not the same wall than the TED view that we're gonna talk about very soon. So lateral wall, septum, and this is the anterior lateral wall of the LV. You can almost see this displacement of the tricuspid valve, which is a bit more inferior compared to the mitral valve the right atrium, the left atrium, okay? And then when you're doing, and this is the LV, so you can see nicely the endocardial border. You can see the mitral valve open and close. And then when you're doing a two chamber view, what you're seeing is actually, you're cutting 90 degrees of that. So you're now you're seeing the interior of your left ventricle. So this is towards the skin, 
And this is posterior, which is towards the spine. Okay, so when you're doing the image, you're turning and now you're seeing towards the skin, so anteriorly and then posteriorly. So you see the posterior wall of your LV and the anterior wall of your LV. So if you're able to see the, the lateral and the septum, and then you go on the other side and you see the anterior and the posterior, you can use the information you get there to trace your LV and reconstitute the volume of your left ventricle. That's why we're using the apical four chamber and two chamber to do something called the Simpson spike plane. We also see the left atrial appendage that looks like a, like a pinky finger. You can see it here, okay, which is anterior in the left ventricle. And you can see the left atrium, which you can also quantify volume by doing the same thing, uh, by measuring in four chamber and in two chamber to get a volume of your left atrium. Although more and more data are coming out that if you're doing only in the four chamber for the left atrium, it's probably sufficient. So ejection fraction can be assessed by, uh, sorry, um, LV function can be estimated in SysTD via multiple different metrics. One of them being the ejection fraction. An ejection fraction can also be assessed in multiple metrics. An ejection fraction, it's what it says. It's a fraction of the ejection. So it's typically calculated as the end diastolic volume to end systolic volume fraction of the end diastolic volume. So now you need ways to estimate this LV and diastolic volume and LV and systolic volume. And because we know that the LV has a shape of a bullet, we can try to assess, um, we can try to assess this uh, using these properties that we know mathematically can be calculated uh, based on the imaging that we're doing. Now, this bullet shape assumption may not be true if you have congenital heart defect, where the LV does not take that shape. It's not true also if you start having the septal wall that starts to flatten or bow in cystine. It's not a. It's not going to be this bullet anymore in cystine. It's going to start becoming like squeezed, right? It's going to look like a crescent. So you have to be aware of these assumptions to know their limitations. Okay. Uh, also, ejection fraction can be preserved even if you have areas of the walls that are not working well. So think about patients, for example, who have some degree of uh, conduction blocks where you can still have a very normal ejection fraction, but there's areas of the ventricles that are not getting activated at the appropriate timing. It doesn't mean that the actual systolic function is completely normal. Also, you can have areas that are ischemic that are not actually contracting and they're just moving because the other areas are bringing, they're dragging these areas. They're, we'll call this, we call this fettering effect. So we see that in patients with some degree of coronary ischemia or subendocardial ischemia. We see that in patients that have like um, some patchy heterogeneous LV disease, like fibrosis or beginning of cardiomyopathy. And that's why sometimes ejection fraction does not pick, pick this up. And more and more, at least in the pediatric and adult world, we're using strain to see if there are some of these areas that are actually not working, okay? Also, there's multiple methods based on mathematical models assuming this bullet shape. So for example, you can use the M mode to estimate the ejection fraction. There's a, something called the Tycho's equation, which converts the diameters that you take into a bullet shape assumption. But then again, you're using a measurement on an M mode to quantify an entire volume. So you can imagine how this is prone to mistakes. Um, and, um, and we know that there's also different scheme, but uh, you know some people are using the cutoff of 55% as being abnormal. And there's other papers that use a cutoff of 50% as abnormal. And, and it's not exactly the same in adult and pediatrics. So I've put you under the, um, if you go under the website in the left ventricular function, I have a whole section on ejection fraction actually. So this one uh, classifies in pediatric as normal being 55%, um, mild as 41 to 55, moderate as 31 to 40, and severe as less than 30. But you can see that there are other schemes like the American College of Cardiology has classified for adults that normal is between 50 to 70. Um, and then if you look at the adult classification of something called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 
uh, they actually use lower cutoff for that. They say, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, they use that, that the 50%. Heart failure with pres preserved ejection fraction is a concept in adult medicine where you can have heart failure that is strictly diastolic. So a problem with filling and that you don't have yet issues with your contraction. So for example, in patients that have like a lot of coronary ischemia and they get a lot of like fibrosis of their LV, initially, uh, like after heart attack, they can have difficulty like relaxing the left ventricle and they start getting like pulmonary edema and they start having symptoms of pulmonary edema and pulmonary hypertension because of the LV drainage issue, the left atrial drainage issue, they get post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So we call these phenotypes a heart failure preserved ejection fraction. So just so you're aware of the, of the nomenclature. Also, before I forget, you can sometimes use um, these metrics to quantify if it's like a hyperdynamic heart. Although in neonates, there's not a lot of data about this, but you're often seeing the literature of, um, of point of care ultrasound that people will use, for example, values of shortening fraction above 46 or above 45% to say that this is a hyperdynamic heart, but it's not been validated a lot in, in the newborn. How are we doing? Are you guys like, okay? Or you're like a piece of your soul is dying right now? No, we I'm are okay. good. <laughs> We're good? Do I, yeah. do I continue for another 30 minutes? Yeah, of course. Go... Okay, of course. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, okay, so we're not gonna go over all this today, but I want you to be aware uh, that there's nomenclatures and classifications that are internationally accepted and it's been adopted by uh, uh, American Society of Echo. And it's very important you're aware of these segmentations. It's important you're aware because when you're gonna be looking at segmental anomalies of the left ventricle or issues of your left ventricle, especially in research, you need to know how we speak the same language. So typically, if you look in the apical views, you have the base, you have the apex. So it's easy, that's apex, 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 and that's everything that's gonna be closer to the mitral valve is gonna be close, it's gonna be called the base. And then in the middle, it's the mid sections. So you get basal, mid, apex. Now, if you're looking at different views, you're different looking at different walls. So here we're looking at the septum and here we're looking, you remember, at the anterior lateral wall. Huh? I mentioned it here. This is the anterior lateral wall. This is the posterior or inferior wall. And this is the interior wall. So if you go in your two chamber, this is gonna be what we call the inferior wall and it's gonna be the anterior wall. So that's why uh, sometimes it's called the inferior lateral and it's called the anterior septal wall. Uh, sorry, I'm here, I'm here. Apical uh, two chamber, inferior wall and anterior wall. Yeah, sorry, I completely misguided you. Inferior wall, anterior wall, and then in your parasternal long axis or in your modified apical three chamber view, you're gonna see the inferior lateral wall and you're gonna see the anterior septal wall. Does that make sense? Because you can see that it's the septum here and then there's a bit of the RG. So we can use the four chamber here and the two chamber here to create discs. So if I do it only in one view, the machine will assume that the diameter is a perfect circle versus if I do it in the two views, it will adjust the diameter of the disc to be an oval. And if I do tons of disc, and I think if I remember well, the equation is always gonna be based on 20 discs. It's gonna measure all these discs together and create a volume. And you're gonna be able to estimate an end diastolic volume, an end systolic volume, the this minus this gives you a stroke volume. So 8.66 minus 2.85 is a stroke volume of 5.82. And your stroke volume divided by your end diastolic volume gives you ejection fraction, which here it's called the biplane because you're using two planes. You're using the plane in the apical four chamber view and the apical two chamber view. And that's basically the equation of all these volumes, of all these disks. It's the equation of the Simpson. And so it tells you that there's 67%. You can also here see what it's been calculated in four chamber in diastole and systole and the stroke volume injection fraction, what it calculated in two chamber, and then putting the disks together, it gives you a biplane of 67%. Um, so the sum of the disk at the peak of systole, um, sorry, end diastolic volume, 
is the sum of the disk at the peak of diastole, peak of filling. This is when the mitral valve is closed. Okay, so you go, you go on your on your four chamber. Can I pause this? No, I cannot pause it. Sorry. Let me see if I can go to another one. Do I have another? I don't have another one that I can pause. You have to pause it when it's completely filled, but at the valve closure. At the valve closure, not when the valve is open. Same thing in systole at the valve closure. Diastole valve closure, systole valve closure. And then you do what? You actually try to trace your endocardial border. Okay. And you should not trace the papillary muscle. You don't trace it, you include the papillary muscle. Does that make sense? So you really trace your endocardial border. Okay. So you can do the same thing. You can you can estimate the volume by using another equation. So let's say you had a cylinder. If you had a cylinder, if you take a circle and you measure the area of that circle and you measure it and you multiply it by the length, it's give you the volume of a cylinder. Does that make sense? So let's say I go in parasternal short axis and I go at the mid papillary level and in systole, I measure the area. And then, sorry, in diastole, I measure the area. And then in systole, I measure the area. So I have the area of that circle in systole, in diastole, and I have the area of the circle in systole when it's the peak of contraction. So if I have the length of this ventricle in diastole and the length of this ventricle in systole, I can evaluate what's the volume if it was a cylinder by doing the area times the length, right? So if I do this area, which is 2.92 or three centimeters square, and I multiply it by the length, which is 3.4 centimeter, I'm gonna get the volume of the ventricle if it was a cylinder. But now it's not a cylinder. I just told you it's a bullet shape. So it's getting tapered towards the bottom. So there's an equation where you multiply this by five and you divide it by six. And based on the MRI model, it's almost the same as the bullet shape. So you basically take a cylinder and you assume it's bullet shape by multiplying by this fraction of five over six. It's called the bullet five six method for calculating ejection fraction. So you can calculate the volume at the end of diastolic uh, period, and you can calculate the volume when it's end systolic, and then you can plug it into the equation. Does that make sense? Yes. Here? Perfect. So this actually is one of the techniques that's been recommended by the TNE uh, guidelines. Uh, the aerial length or the bullet shape method or the five six method, and it's particularly good uh, or more. Um, we th we think we don't know for sure, but we think that it's um, a a bit more sensitive to septal flattening, so 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 that it can um, give you a better assessment of ejection fraction when there's some distortion of the septal motion. You can use the uh, apical view to measure the diameter of the atrioventricular valves. So here it's a measurement of the mitral valve at the hinge point of the valve when it's open. And you can do the same thing, tricuspid valve when it's open, not when it's closed. Why? Because most Z scores, cohorts that are available are based on when the valve is open. And typically it's open, when it opens, it means that you're filling so it means that it's going to be the largest diameter of the valve. It's not the narrowest diameter when it's closed. Make sense? Then we put collar box over the, the valve to see the inflow. So the inflow is supposed to go from the atrium towards the apex. So it's supposed to be red because it's going towards the probe. And here you can see there is a trace mitral insufficiency because it's blue when the valve is closed. So there is a bit of blood regurgitating into the left atrium. And then here, a trace of tricuspid regurgitation, which is blue during the valve closure. Uh, and the valve, those valve closes in cystity. Here, I put a collar over the atrium. I dropped a bit my velocity filter, and I can see a bit of my 
pulmonary vein. So this is the left lower pulmonary vein. And then here I can see in red, the right upper pulmonary vein. Yeah, the right upper pulmonary vein. I can use my pulse wave Doppler and then look at the profile. So you can see that there's the S waves and then the D wave. And then you're going towards the baseline where you get a bit of a atrial maybe regurgitation or atrial reflux here, but it's not that obvious in this particular scheme. And then this is the Doppler in the right upper pulmonary vein. So you get an S wave and a D wave. Um, so S wave here and then a D wave here. And you can see that the velocity filter is relatively low and you can see the pulmonary vein here. And so the different cardiac, the different uh, waves informs you on different portions of the cardiac cycle. So typically you're gonna have your early filling and then your atrial cake. And you can see that during the atrial cake, sometimes you get a brief period of reversal and the duration of that at least in adults, have been correlated with some degree of diastolic dysfunction, although this marker has been abandoned by the recent classification of diastolic dysfunction in adults, to be honest, because it, it's very variable and it's not always obtained. Um, so during the early phase of facet filling, you get the diastolic also velocities. And so you can use the D velocity as also a marker of PDA significance in the early phase of uh, a left to right PDA shunt. Uh, so in the first week of life, for example. Now with time, if you get too much torrential pulmonary blood flow, your pulmonary vein might start kind of dilating, right? Like if you take any structure that is elastic and you go and you put a lot of flow through it, eventually you might have some degree of dilatation. So we don't know if this marker is still a marker that is reliable for kind of estimation of velocity of the left to right shunt via PDA when it gets towards older stages. Like for example, when the kid is now like seven or eight weeks of life, because maybe the vein is not as narrow anymore and um, your, D, your D velocity will start going down. Does that make sense what I just said? Because a lot of the, the markers, like for example, I'll give you an example. If you look at the website and you're trying to assess ductal shunt, you know, markers of echocardiographic markers of ductal shunt significance, um, I'll, I'll bring your attention to the section on PDA. And there's many different, um, no, that's nobology, PDA. There's many different um, classification scoring systems, as you know. But some of them will use uh, the D the D wave. So, for example, the Iowa calculator they use the D wave velocity, and the higher velocity, the higher points you get because it means that you get more torrential blood flow through your lungs and more torrential blood flow coming back via your pulmonary vein. And actually, in babies in the first few days of life, premature that have really big left to right shunts, you can actually when you put your color box, your velocity filter could be like at ninety, and you still see pulmonary venous flow because the flow is at high velocity. So, so that's a marker indirectly that there's a lot of blood flow going through the lungs. But this is true, like this calculator has been done for babies being stat, scanned in the first day of life or the first three days of life or four days of life. But we don't know if it's true, these values for down the road later on. So that's another, that's the one from the Rotunda manual where you can see they look at pulmonary vein Doppler, and they also classify the pulmonary vein Doppler. So there, there's different classification scheme uh, based on the, this, the different assumptions uh, you can see and you can try to read on them to see what are they trying to, to measure. So that's another example, pulmonary vein D wave velocity in meters per second. And they also get these cutoff values. That's an article by uh, another uh, article where the reference is here. Um, so, this is for this, we spoke about that. So um, then, so when you put your color box, we wanna put the uh, cursor uh, for sampling 
the velocities of the inflow of both the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve at that area that's very red at the tip of the mitral valve or the tip of the tricuspid valve. So often we'll put a color box, we'll see exactly where the red is filling the left ventricle at the tip of the valve. We're gonna obtain, so you can see this is the tip of the valve, you're gonna obtain the velocity. And the velocity here informs you on the filling properties of the ventricle, as well as how much the left atrium is emptying inside your ventricle. So it informs you on the interaction between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And so sometimes you can use these metrics also for uh, certain classification schemes of uh, PDA. Why? Because the PDA that is very left to right provides a lot of pulmonary blood flow. Eventually there's a lot of pulmonary blood flow going back by the pulmonary veins, filling your left atrium. If your left atrium doesn't decompress via an atrial shunt into your right atrium, well, it gets overfilled, it starts dilating. That's why the left to uh, atrium to aorta ratio. And eventually when the valve opens, you get changes in dynamics in terms of how rapid you get a gush of blood flow inside your left ventricle. So if your left atrium is overfilled, when the mitral valve is gonna open, it's gonna send a huge velocity inside your left ventricle. And that's why Eon A's, so early velocity to late velocity ratio, is much higher than one in high transductal left to right shunts. That's the reason why you get that. Unless your left atrium uh, decompresses via a huge interatrial shunt into the right atrium, right? Then you get less of these velocities because, but it's, it's often not the case, right? Most often the premature babies, they have a tiny PFO and the tiny PFO can start stretching right? But it's not going to be enough to decompress completely the left atrium. So here you have time, here you have velocity, and so you have the E and you have the A. The E often corresponds to the early phase of passive filling of your ventricle, and then the A is the atrial contraction. And QRS, ventricular systole, the mitral valve close, sorry, then um, yeah, ventricular systole, then the mitral valve opens. This is a motion of the valve, mitral valve opens, and eventually you get your E wave and your A wave. And so you can get the peak velocity, which is the peak E V max here. And number two is your peak A max, 0 0.46. And you can do the ratio of E on A, which here is, is much higher. And you would expect it in ventricular ventricles that are very, very compliant. So in normal diastolic conditions, you would expect a ratio of E on A to be above one. But babies, especially those that are premature, in the first few days of life, typically their ventricle is still very stiff. Typically their ventricle muscle is still very um, predominant because of the fetal physiology. And so it takes a bit of time for this ventricle to remodel. So that's why in the first few days of life, in babies that are and they have very tiny PDA, often you'll get a low E wave and a fast A wave. And so this ratio is less than one, unless you have a big PDA. So that's why this PDA score, some of the PDA scoring system, they tell you, you get a ratio above one. Now with time, this changes, right? Preemies, their ventricle are gonna adapt, they're gonna become more compliant. So this marker is a good marker for the first few days, but when you get to 36 weeks, it's not true anymore. Their LV is supposed to be compliant. So this ratio is supposed to be above one. The other thing is that often these, these waves are gonna be fused at fast heart rate. So sometimes you're not able to see well the difference between your E and your A. And in adults, because they're often able to see very nicely the initial velocity phase to the next velocity phase, they're also able to calculate something called the E-wave deceleration time or deceleration slope. So this is the time and this is the slope. And it's been used in some research to assess uh, if it can be an early marker of uh, diastolic dysfunction. But there's obviously not much data in the newborn because often these curves are fused. And don't forget, these are speed, they're not distances. So that's an example where you see there is some degree of fusion, but you can still see your E and your A. And this is a premature baby who had, um, I think if I remember well, a very tiny duct. So you can see that the E is below the A wave, which is expected in the first few days of these babies. It's either gonna be the same, so a ratio of one, 
or it's going to be a ratio of E on A that's going to be less than one because the A is bigger than the E. This is another example of the baby who has higher E over A. So, so this is a baby that's a bit more older, uh, like six, uh, you know, like a few weeks of age uh, and has normal ventricular compliance. The other thing is that there's typically minimal variation in this with breathing. And if you start seeing a lot of variation, um, you know, that's one of the signs we see in babies with pericardial effusion that have tamponade. So if you go, and I invite you to, on your time, go read the section on tamponade, okay? Because echocardiographically, there's indirect sign that we can look to see if an effusion is clinically significant or not. Like if the baby is minimally symptomatic or not symptomatic, or you're not sure if the symptoms are related to the pericardial effusion, sometimes you're not gonna drain, especially in babies or in kids, mostly kids that do chronic pericardial effusion. You don't want to drain every time. So, so there are ways to echocardiographically assess if this tamponade is causing diastolic restricted filling because tamponade is a diastolic disease. It's a disease preventing filling of the ventricle. That's how tamponade eventually leads to cardiac uh, arrest. It's because the ventricle is not able to fill. So you can see here that sometimes we're gonna compress the time over the velocity. And you can see that in patients with tamponade effect, they get this high variability when they're spontaneously breathing. You're not gonna get that if you're intubated and ventilated, but if they're spontaneously breathing or on CPAP, you're gonna see these kinds of variability. And that's a sign that it has some degree of diastolic effect or tamponade effect. Let me reopen. I'm not sure why all the clips did not open. So you can see that both for the tricuspid side. So here you're on the tricuspid, tricuspid, tricuspid. You can also see that on the mitral side. So this is the mitral side where you get variability. And the cutoffs are, are not exactly the same. So we say that the normal variability is less than 40%. So if you take your higher peak and your lowest peak, uh, there should be a difference. If you get a difference of more than 40%, then obviously this is abnormal. So let's say you have, I don't know, 100 meters per uh, centimeters per second and four and 20 milliliters per second. Well, 100 minus 20 divided by 100 is much more than 40%, right? Same, same for the LV side, it's 25%. That's considered to be the normal variation. So here you see there's like actually minimal variation. It's not so bad. So it depends on the spectrum that you take and it's taking all the information. The other thing, when you have pericardial tamponade or when you have pericardial fusion, you wanna measure it in diastole. You don't wanna measure it in systole, the diameter. You see here, the, the cursor is actually here on almost the QRS. This is the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle. Why? Because you wanna see what effect it has during re-expansion. A tamponade is gonna cause you issue in diastole. So you can have liquid in systole when the ventricle is very contracted, but if the ventricle is able to completely expand in the pericardial sac, even if you have pericardial effusion, you probably don't have a tamponade effect, right? Because your ventricle is able to expand completely and fill. And sometimes in kids who have had chronic pericardial effusion for various disease, autoimmune disease, inflammatory disease, um, non-acute situation, uh, chronic uh, pericardial effusion secondary to cancer, for example, th their, their pericardial sac will have had time to adapt. It will become more distended. So this ventricle is able to kind of fill and contract very nicely. Does that make sense for you guys? Just this little short tamponade uh, explanation? Sorry, could you repeat uh, the differentiation for the cut point to the act, the um, cardiac tamponade that you say yeah. 40% is mean the e difference in the height of the E and A? Exactly. So you see when you compress it, when you compress, first of all, often these patients, they have fusion of the waves because they get diastolic filling restriction. So the timing of diastole becomes shorter. But what you would do is take, take the height. So here you can see there's an E and there's an A. There's an E and there's an A. So you would pick the highest point and you would pick the lowest point and you would do the fraction of that. So let's say this is 100, this is 40. This is 100 minus 40 gives you 60, 60. 60 divided by 100 is 60%. So clearly there's a difference of 60%. It's more than 40, 
So that's abnormal. But just visually, just visually, when you start seeing a lot of variation, this is not normal. You're not supposed to have a lot of this variation. You're supposed to have almost like a flat line. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be almost no variation. Like if I would put a line like this here, you can see the variation is minimal between these peaks. It's minimal. Why? Because breathing should not have so much effect on your diastolic phase of filling. Because why? Because the ventricular pressure at the beginning of diastole is extremely low. So it's always going to empty at a certain velocity if your compliance is good. But the, is picture, that clear? You showed, the picture you showed, the E and A is the fills. Should we increase the velocity to extend more at the E and A? Or so, we... no. So, ideal. Yeah, that's a good question. When you're assessing tamponade, you'd like to see, because you don't want to miss variations. Over. So often what we'll do, we'll actually compress it to really see a few respiratory cycle. Why? Because breathing is much slower than heart rate. So mm -hmm. let's say you have a kid that breathes at 25 per minute. These are kids, right? So they're, they're, these are examples of more pediatric. Babies, they're going to breathe at 40, 45 per minute, but their heart rate is going to be 180. So to, mm -hmm. capture, to capture variability with breathing, on the same time, you need to compress a lot because you want to see two or three or four breathing, right? So if you want to see two or four breathing at a, you know, you and you you're breathing at 40 or 50 breaths per minute. So to get four breaths in your in your and see the impact on cardiac filling, you need kind of like all of this time point. You need many like a few, you know, maybe a few seconds to see like four or five breaths and see the impact of breathing. Does that make sense? Because if not, if you capture only two or three beats, maybe you captured one breath, one breath. So you're not gonna see this variation. Yeah. I Does see. that answer you, Pessini? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we do the same, we put color on the RV inflow. And we do the same, we do the E on the A, and we can do the ratio as a marker of uh, ventricular RV compliance. Same thing, the early phase of filling, the active phase or the atrial kick. And obviously this depends also on how the right atrium is filling, which is dependent on the systemic venous return. It depends on the RV compliance, on the filling time, on the tricuspid valve integrity. So there, you know, this marker can be, can be affected by many things, but it's often something, at least at the research level, that we're going to acquire and inquire and, and evaluate so that we can, um, we can uh, quantify this in certain disease states to see if there's a signal of difference. Uh, so here where you see sometimes you get uh, a very a lower E compared to an A, which is often some, a pattern that we see in the early days of babies because they've been uh, exposed to, you know, the fetal environment and they have a bit of, you know, higher RV predominance compared to LV predominance. So their RV is still a bit more hypertrophied and it's not yet uh, remodeled. Uh, so often you'll get normalization of this ratio, which is typically a higher E than an A, uh, when they start to be like a week or two weeks of life. And it's similar to the ECG. You know, when you get an electrocardiogram and your T wave and V1 is positive in the first few days of life, but starting at five days of life, you should always have a negative T wave and V1, always, always, until you're the age of about five to seven years old. Um, so, so the same because the RV remodels and in the first few days, you have a bit of RV predominance, but starting like five to seven days of life, you're supposed to have a higher E to, to A wave. But in the first few days of life, you can have a reversal of this pattern and it's completely part of normal because your PVR are still adjusting. So indirect marker of diastolic dysfunction, the E on A ratio, the E on E prime. So We'll go over E on E prime when we talk about TD tissue Doppler imaging. So E on A, typically you have a higher velocity of blood flow at the opening of the atrial ventricular valve because that's when the atrium is completely filled. 
And so you open your valve and you get this gush of fluid into your ventricle that's now completely empty. So the gradient of the gradient of pressure is at the highest peak at that point between the atrium and the ventricle. And then eventually you get residual emptying during the atrial contraction. As, as we know, the atrial contribution to the filling is, is much lower than the contribution of the passive filling. And so if you start having ventricular stiffness, your ventricle is more stiff. So when your valves are opening, it's harder for the atrium to empty into this ventricle in a passive fashion compared to a ventricle who's very, very compliant, right? So when you're opening your valve and everything is happening passively, if your ventricle is very stiff and blocked, the atrium that the, vent the, the valve just opened, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna fill, but it's gonna go at a much lower velocity of filling because it's facing a stiff ventricle. And that's why at that point, your E-wave is at a higher velocity. Why? Because you get more residual volume in your atrium at the time of the atrial contraction. And if you follow the Frank Starling curve, of, you know, if you increase the volume of a structure that's contractile, it's going to contract more forcefully. So if your atrium has more residual volume at the end of diastole, when it's going to contract, it's going to generate a higher velocity inside this stiff ventricle. Does that make sense? The E on E prime is the ratio of how much the blood flow filling is going fast during the passive phase of filling compared to how fast this ventricle is stretching during this passive phase. So if it's very stiff, if the ventricle is very stiff, when you're gonna try to fill it, the, the speed at which it's gonna fill, it's gonna be very slow because it's a passive filling. If the ventricle is very compliant, when, when it's starting to fill, it's, the speed of it, it's gonna be very fast because the ventricle is extremely compliant. It's easy to get filled. It's like a balloon that you can very easily open. So, so this ratio, okay, is gonna be very low. It's gonna be very low in babies that have very compliant ventricles. Why? Because this speed, it's going to be very high. So if you put a very high denominator, this ratio is going to be very low. Does that make sense? If the speed is very, very low, this ratio is going to be very, very high. So when ventricles are very stiff, when you have diastolic dysfunction, this ratio is going to start increasing a lot because the velocity at which the myocardium is able to expand in diastole at the passive phase of filling is going to be very limited. Other indirect signs that there might be diastolic compromise are when you look at the venous return in the corresponding atrium. So for example, if you have high right-sided atrial pressure, which often reflects right ventricular diastolic dysfunction, well, the veins are going to have difficulty draining into the, this right atrium. So for example, you're going to start seeing a bit of retrograde flow in the hepatic veins or retrograde flow in the IVC or SVC. Your IVC is going to start becoming enlarged. If you have a natural shunt, you're going to start to see right to left atrial shunting. Uh, you're going to start having hepatomegaly clinically, unless if you have a big atrium and the atrium can decompress into the left atrium, then obviously your right atrium is not going to increase in pressure because it's able to pop off somewhere. So maybe your liver is not going to become bigger, but your baby is going to become blue because you get a big fraction of deoxygenated blood from the right atrium and during your left atrium. So when you're seeing a patient that's a bit older, like let's say an ex pram who's now at 40, 45 weeks and has pulmonary hypertension, if the baby is very blue, it's probably because there's a lot of blood flow going from the right atrium to the left atrium and it makes the baby blue. You're probably going to go, you're not even going to feel, feel a liver. That doesn't mean that the baby is not in RV diastolic dysfunction. Actually, this baby is in RV diastolic dysfunction because he's blue. He's just able to preserve cardiac output. If the baby has a huge liver and he's gray, it's because your wall in your atrium is not able to kind of pop off your right atrium right? There's no shunt, basically. So then everything backs up into the IVC, 
and then your liver becomes big. And then the baby doesn't have great output. Why? Because there's no blood flow going into the RV to the pulmonary vasculature and the pulmonary vasculature is then not able to fill your left ventricle. And then your left ventricle has poor output because of that, because it has a low preload. We're gonna have a whole session on pulmonary hypertension. So don't worry if that's like still unclear to you guys. Same thing on the left side, if you start having diastolic dysfunction, you can start looking at things like pulmonary venous Doppler. So you get something called a long atrial regurgitation time during the left atrial contraction. And often these patients with severe LV diastolic dysfunction, you'll see they'll get like pulmonary edema on chest X-ray. Like, so babies, like for example, who've been exposed to a very prolonged steroid or infant of diabetic mother, and they have severe LV hypertrophy, their ventricle is very stiff. These patients, they'll present with like pulmonary edema, fluffy lungs. Uh, they have a lot of secretions, uh, things like that. Uh, there is a marker that's called the TIE index, which is the myocardial performance index. It's an index of systolic and diastolic function, like combined. So, um, so that's also a marker you can look in diastolic dysfunction. Um, that's quite interesting. And then the interatrial shunt also informs you on the relationship between the right atrium and the left atrium. So remember how I told you when you look at the septal wall motion, you have to know what's happening between the RV and the LV. Same thing, when you're looking at the atrial shunt, you can tell, okay, well, what's happening in the corresponding atrium. If I have a left to right shunt, it's because my LA pressure is higher than my right atrial pressure. Well, is it because my LA pressure is normally, is, is it that my LA pressure is normally higher than my right atrial pressure that has a normal pressure? Is it that my LA pressure is abnormally high and my RA pressure is normally normal? It has a normal pressure. Is it that my, you know, um, both of them have low pressure, but the LE is still higher than the RE? So it's it's like when you're putting together directionality, you always need to consider that may, one may be higher than the other, and one thing is abnormal or normal, or everything could be within the normal status. TR. Um, so you can use now the opportunity of continuing. So these markers are done by pulse wave Doppler because it's an instantaneous velocity that you're interested in. So it's a PW. Now you can apply to the regurgitation of these valves, of the atrial ventricular valve, you can do a continuous wave Doppler if you get regurgitation. The continuous wave Doppler informs you on uh, the velocity across the entire line of interrogation. So for example, this is an example of continuous wave Doppler through TR. So you have the QRS, the ventricle starts contracting, you get peak of contraction, eventually you get deceleration. And then here you get the diastolic phase of the cardiac cycle. You can actually see very nicely here, this is the systolic and this is the diastolic. So, so you're able to use the velocity to put in the Bernoulli equation to get something called the RV to RA gradient in pressure. And the Bernoulli equation is four times velocity to the square. So let's say your velocity is 5.5. Well, 5.5 times 5.5 times four gives you the pressure gradient, which is 119 millimeters of mercury. So this is the pressure difference between the two cavities. That's the simplified Bernoulli equation. The assumption is that this velocity is through a narrow point. Okay, that's the assumption. So if it's not through a narrow point, you cannot really rely on that. So for example, the PDA we know is not a narrow point, it's a tube. So you have to be aware of the assumption and their limitation. And if you assume that the right atrial pressure is five and you have a gradient of 119, if you do 119 plus five, it's going to give you the peak RV systolic pressure, which in this case is going to be 124. And if you assume that the peak RV systolic pressure is the same as the peak pulmonary pressure, the peak systolic pulmonary pressure, you're, this is going to be giving you an estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressure. Okay, so four V square gives you 119. You add uh, five, it gives you 124. So the RV peak systolic pressure is an estimate of the systolic pulmonary arterial pressure. So it's an estimate of for pulmonary hypertension, for example. So if your systolic systemic blood pressure is 65 at the time, you do 124 over 65, it tells you it's twice systemic. Okay.
So that's another example. So you can see that I'm actually moving my probe to align myself, my, my line of interrogation. And then I capture my TR. So I get QRS, I get my ascending portion and then deceleration. And what I want is not to take the hair here. I want really the chin of the beard, okay? So really, I want the chin. I don't want these hair here. I want here, not this. This is the TR, okay? The other thing you can do, and you can see when we do CW here, you see the systolic phase, and you actually see the E and the A wave in diastole. And then the valve motion, this is the valve motion of the tricuspid valve. It's the annulus motion, this little bar. And then you restart systole, 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 the end of systole, and then diastole, E and A. Motion of the valve, systole, 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 peak of systole, and then E on A. So you could also measure a marker that we call systolic to diastolic time ratio. This is one cardiac cycle. And in cardiac cycle, you get a portion in systole and a portion in diastole. And you can see here, you're not spending one third of your time in systole and two thirds in diastole. In this particular patient, actually, they're spending more time in systole. And we know that kids who have more RV dysfunction spend more time in systole. Same thing for LV. As your LV becomes more dysfunctional, you need more time to empty it. So your systolic to diastolic time ratio is going to increase. It's often a marker that's used in congenital heart defect, like hypoplastic left heart syndrome. They're going to measure the systolic to the diastolic time ratio as a marker of the systemic RV ventricle function. So it's something that's been used in some of the patients with VPD pulmonary hypertension as a marker to follow the systolic function of the RV. We call this the systolic to diastolic time ratio, and I'm going to show you how to measure it in one of the upcoming slides. So this is the TAPC. TAPC stands for tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. In order to obtain the TAPC, what's been described is that your line of interrogation should pass through the attachment of the tricuspid valve and through the apex. And then you see this is time. And this, these are the pixels along the line of interrogation. So you can follow, you can, you see the line of the attachment of the tricuspid valve. So this line, which is the attachment track. And you can follow as this tricuspid valve is plunging inside the RV cavity and measure this distance. So this is a distance in millimeter. Okay, it's not a speed like Doppler, it's a distance. And so here you're measuring an absolute displacement um, how far is the tricuspid valve going inside the RV cavity? And it provides you an indirect information about the longitudinal properties of the contraction of the right ventricle. I told you the RV is a ventricle that works mostly longitudinally in terms of its contraction, and that's why we're using that. Now, you can do the same on the, on the left side. You could do something called the MAPC. I think I have an example somewhere. Yeah, this is a MAPC, right? This, we're putting the line on the apex, Sorry, the image is inverted. You're putting the line on the apex of the LV, and then you're putting it through the attachment of the mitral valve, and then you can see the motion. So I could measure the distance, which is the MAPC, and there's actually normative value that's been published by gestational age. But the reason we often don't use it is that it only measures the longitudinal function of the LV, and I just told you that the longitudinal function of the LV is a minimal contributor to the LV function. That's why we use ejection fraction, shortening fraction, all these other elements that try to estimate the circumferential contraction of the LV. Because the LV functions majority as a circumferential contractile ventricle. Okay, so this are, these are examples of TAPC. So here we're measuring from, so you basically have to picture the line and then follow your line on your M mode and then you do your, your measurements, which is gonna give you a distance. <laughs> so I have my line here, and then I, you can see that there's many lines, right? So this, I would take the bright line that corresponds to the attachment of the tricuspid valve, and I would follow my line, and I go from systole to diastole. And sometimes you can use TDI, tissue Doppler, to indicate the portion that is systole and the portion that is diastole, because you get the motion 
So you know that in systole, it's going to be red. And in diastole, it's going to be blue because you're in systole, the ventricle is coming towards the probe. So it's going to be red. And the, so you can go from the onset of red to the end of red. But most people will do it just with the M mode uh, in grayscale. Uh, so you have to be careful about your angle of inter interrogation, like any M mode. Uh, and you have to make sure that it passes at least through the apex. That's at least the recommendation. And there are guidelines and there are TAPSI calculators for the Z-score. So if you go on the Neocardio Lab and you go to the normative value section uh, here and you go to uh, normal values, you can have a section on TAPSI Z-score and it will bring you to the TAPSI calculator by parameter Z. So then you can put the gestational age, for example, let's say we say 38 weeks, and this is a TAPSI in centimeters. So you have to be careful, let's say we say one centimeter, and it's gonna tell you, okay, this, this is very normal. Like this is a Z-score above two, so it's even the upper limit of normal. So maybe this RV is a bit hyperdynamic. So you can just say uh, 0 0.9 centimeter. And then this is with a normal limit. It tells you that it's normal. And then you can even put multiple values and then trend, you know, you have history on this computer and things like that. Okay. So that's for TAPSI. Uh, where is my presentation? It's here. Okay. MAPSI, I spoke about it. It's the same group of Dr. Kostenberger who published this normative value. But as I told you, it's not something I use typically, but it's an easy uh, metric to acquire, especially if you're teaching in your unit, like things like point of care ultrasound, and you want to teach people like a quantifiable, easy metric to get. Compared to EF, it's, it's, EF is a much more user dependent and you need experience to use it. The other thing you can do as a marker of RV, as you remember, the RV is a very complex geometry. It's not just a bullet shape, right? If you look at the RV, it looks like uh, it looks like this, um, where did I put my 3D RV here? You see, it looks like almost like uh, the thing that we use, the stomachs that we used to drink from in the desert, you know, like, and, and, and you can see that there's, when I said there's no fibrous continuity, the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve, they're not connected together. So it's a very complex geometry. So mathematically using a 2D image, it's very difficult to, reconstitute what would be the volume of this ventricle in order to calculate an ejection fraction. If you do 3D echo, then it's easier to kind of delineate the walls of the RV and be able to estimate these volumes. Um, but without 3D echo, it becomes a bit more difficult. So people have done some studies to try to see what are the best markers that corresponds to ejection fraction when you're doing an MRI of the right ventricle. And a good marker is TAPSI. Another good marker is what we call the fractional area change. Now, most of the MRI studies have been done with the technique of doing the fractional area change in four chamber view, which means that you trace the endocardial border at the end of diastole. And be careful, huh? you see this line is very straight and this line is very straight. That's how you need to do it. That's how the MRI studies were done. So it actually closed from one tip to the other one, it didn't trace the tricuspid, it didn't trace the, the tricuspid border. It actually traced it as a line here. So end diastolic area and end systolic area, I'll give you another example. You see, I trace, 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 and then I click and it's a, di it's a straight line. Same thing when I go in systole, I trace as a straight line. So that's how the MRI studies were done, and they showed good correlation between fractional area change and ejection fraction of the RV. So the fractional area change is basically the area in diastole minus the area in systole, and all of this divided by end diastolic area, and typically above 35% is very normal. And it's when you start getting below 30% or even, yeah, below 30%, that's when you start having concern that there's some degree of RV, diastolic, uh, RV systolic dysfunction. Um, now, one thing I wanna mention, a fractional area change is basically a change in the area. So you could do a fractional area change of the left ventricle. And there are some centers and some uh, publication where they do it 
they actually do it in the Paris Journal short axis view. So they take the LV and they measure this area and they do exactly the same equation, but in systemy. So 2.92 minus 1.94 divided by 2.92. And we call this the fractional area change of the LV and Paris Journal short axis. So you might see that in some publication as a quick marker of the LV function. It's something that people are starting to use, especially in point of care ultrasound. But it's just only the longitudinal function, right? It's a circumferential function. It does provide you information on circumferential because you're you're comparing the areas along the along the uh, cross section of the LV. So it provides you some information. That's why it's been something that's easy to get that some people use. The problem with that is that it's angle dependent also because depending on how you cut your LV, right? You could be cutting like this, you could be cutting like this. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so fractional area change. I, is it clear the fractional area change for you guys in the apical four chamber view? So recently there's been in the TNE literature a push to use a bit more what we call, what we used to call the TET view or we still call the TET view, like the trilogy of fellow view. Why? Because it's a great view to see the inflow of the RV and the outflow track of the RV. So this is actually the posterior wall and this is the interior wall. So the same way like you can get a two chamber view of your LV where you see your interior and posterior wall, you can do the same thing in your RV. You can get your interior and posterior wall. And here you see the inflow and the outflow and you're every, even very well aligned to put your cursor for getting like Dopplers and RV outflow track. And often in babies to get TR, this is a very good view. And so some authors, and this is example, tricuspid valve, posterior wall, anterior wall, RVOT. Uh, and in the background, we see kind of the aorta. You see this, this vessel is the aorta here. Um, and so you can use that also to do a fractional area change of the RV, but in RV3 chamber. And many authors of the um, TNE groups are recommending to start using this marker as a, that's one of the publication by Amish Jane, where he did that in the first 48 hours in term babies. The only caveat to that is that just so you're aware, um, the, this technique has not been validated with, our, with MRI, with cardiac MRI to see if, if there's good correlation with ejection fraction by MRI. So we only know that the correlation is true to be with the um, with four chamber view, um, but there's one more data looking at that. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, because my AirPods are dead. Okay. Uh, so this is example when we put color in the apical view. There we would obviously do a sweep, like I mentioned, from posterior to anterior, and we would obviously look at the septum also with color to make sure that there's no uh, there's no ventricular septal defect. And then here, it's often a good view. You see some TR and you can see also sometimes you're very well aligned. Actually, we're, we're almost completely parallel with the RV outflow track. So to get Dopplers, it's often a good view too. The ASC uh, also provides some guidance about how to measure structures uh, on the right side. So this is how to do diameters. So to measure the diameter of the RV, you have to be when the RV is completely filled. So that's the peak of diastole of the RV. And it's when the valve is closed. So you remember how the tricuspid valve is when the valve is open? Here, that's when the valve is closed. So be careful when you're doing these measurements. And here we're measuring the base. We're measuring the mid cavity diameter. And then the length is actually just above the valve versus the base is just under the valve. You see the difference above the valve to the apex, just below the valve. And these markers are used to see if there are signs of RV dilatation. The other thing is that when you start having RV diastolic dysfunction, your right atrium is going to start dilating. So there are some papers looking at something called the right atrial planimetry or the right atrial surface area. And so this metric is like where you trace the border of your right atrium to get an area. 
valve close. But the difference between here and here is that this view is at the peak of systole when the RV is completely contracted. Why is it the systole? It's because that's when the atriums are completely filled. You remember we said at the beginning in parasternal uh, views, when you're doing the left atrial diameter, you're doing it when it's ventricular systole because that's when the atrium is completely filled. That's an example of planimetry, 2.65 centimeters square. In this measurement, you get the perimeter. So that's basically you know, the perimeter of that. But what you're interested in is actually the area. We call this the RA planimetry, peak of ventricular systole when the tricuspid valve is closed. RD dimension is at the peak of ventricular diastole when the tricuspid valve is closed. So this is an example. You're doing the base. You're doing the mid, and then you want to do your length just above the tricuspid valve. You can also do the RD length at the peak of systole, but that's less, less being used. But I think for, for the project, we're still measuring the diameter, if I remember, of the length at the peak of systole. And there's some normative RD dimension. I put the reference here. They're actually also uh, linked into the normative data where uh, if you go on the calculators, sorry, if you go on the normative data of the neocardial lab, there is a section on uh, here, this one, periodic echo Z score for left atrium, blah, blah, blah. So you put your height, your weight, your body surface area, and there's a whole section on uh, right atrial area, right atrial basal diameter, mid cavity length, uh, the end systole length, and you can even put your end diastolic and end systolic area, and it's going to give you Z spores to tell you if there's signs that some of them are dilated or bigger than unusual, the, the usual for the body surface area. Okay. I'm going to finish my apical view, and then the next sections we'll do it at another time. So, this is how to measure left atrial volume. Uh, you can do it in uh, the biplane mode. So the same way you did the ejection, the Simpsons biplane for the left ventricle, you can do it for the left atrium. But this time, you remember that what you're interested in is to capture the largest volume of the left atrium. So it's when the, the valve is closed and it's at the peak of systole. So you see the QRS is here, the peak of systole is happening here, and eventually the QRS will restart. This is at the peak of contraction of the left ventricle when the left atrium is uh, very filled. And it's, uh, sorry, at the end of systole of the ventricle when the left atrium is very filled and when the uh, mitral valve is closed. So that's exactly where I would do the right atrial planimetry. And that's where I would do my left atrial volume. And the volume is a volume, so it's in millimeter, milliliters. Here it's expressed at centimeter cube, but a centimeter cube is same thing as a milliliter. So it's 2.43 milliliters. And so obviously, if, unless you have an atrial shunt, it will give you a sense uh, if the LE volume start increasing, it could be because you have significant left or right shunt by a duct, it could be because you have too much pulmonary overcirculation, or it's because you have, like, for example, mitral valve anomalies that's blocking the left atrial emptying, and so there's residual volume in your left atrium, or it could be because there's LV diastolic dysfunction. Then we would do the view where we see the uh, mitral inflow to outflow trap because you want to make sure that there's blood originating below the valve and going through the valve. Just a second. Um, especially in patients with like infant and diabetic mother with hypertrophy or LB hypertrophy, or that you're suspecting that there might be a blockage. It's also the opportunity to see if there's signs of aortic insufficiency. So for example, in patients that have very large PDAs that they get a lot of overcirculation, you're gonna see that at a later stage when they get you know older, uh, like a few weeks of age, their LV starts dilating. So you start having increased LV diameter and eventually your aortic valve will start dilating and you start seeing mitral insufficiency and aortic insufficiency in these patients. So it's a marker, indirect marker of PDA significance. 
So same thing, you want to do pulse wave Doppler with this least amount of angle of interrogation. So ideally, you would want your line of interrogation to be kind of like here, right? Like to be completely aligned with the alcohol track. So you want less than 30 degrees so that you have the most reliable measurement. You have time, you have velocity, and then the same thing as you are going to be doing for the RVL flow track, you want to do the area under the curve, which is called the aortic valve VTI, and you get a, a stroke distance. And then this stroke distance can be expressed when you multiply by heart rate into a minute distance. And once you uh, have your minute distance, you can multiply it by the cross section of the alcohol track and you get an estimate of your output. So that's pretty much the calculation. So cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate and your stroke volume is your VTI times your cross-sectional area. And often in babies, we'll index it to either the body surface area or the weight. Most centers will index it to the weight. And so that's why we express it in, instead of milliliters per minute, we express it as milliliters per kilo per minute. And so the normal values are typically around 150 to 400. If you start having like, you know, more than 350, more than 400, it's probably that there's like, very high output. So we see that, for example, with big, big PDAs. And if you have lo lower than 150, it's probably that your LV or your RV has difficulty in sending output into your outflow tracks. So the limitation is that um, you have high margin of error when you're doing the LVOT measurements. You can see, oh yeah, it's squared. Sorry, I said earlier that it was to the three, but it's squared. So you're doubling your, your mistake. Uh, but it's still important to assess in certain part, you know, condition to make sure that you know you can you can follow your patients uh, in terms of the effect uh, on the LVO and the RVO. So that's just an example where we're tracing the spectral envelope of your of your Doppler of your LVOT, and then here I'm getting a VTI of one of 0 0.42, one, 0 0.142. And if I multiply this by heart rate and I multiply this by the cross-sectional area that I get from my LVOT diameter, I can get an estimate of the LVO. So that's from the TNE guidelines where they're showing you how to measure the LVOT diameter like we did and uh, to measure your, and here they're very well aligned. You can see they're very well aligned with your alpha track. So the alpha track is going this way and then the angle of insulation is going this way. So you're able to eventually uh, estimate the surface area, so the radius to the square, uh, and then, sorry, the equation is, oh, did I remove the equation? I probably removed the equation, but I put the, um, I created a calculator here that if you go onto the neocardio lab, and you go in calculators, you're going to have an output calculator that's here. So right or left ventricular output. So you can put the VT, the outflow track diameter in centimeter, the weight of the patient, the heart rate, and then the velocity time integral that you get uh, in meters. And then it will provide you an estimate of your cardiac output. OK. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. So we went through this, we went through that. So that's just an example for the RVO. So low RVO is also considered to be low when you're less than 150. So we see that in patients with like PPHN, RV dysfunction, uh, um, they'll get low RVO. So like baby with HIE also. And so here you have the VTI, which is expressed in centimeter. And then here, um, and then you can get the heart rate and then get your output based on that. So same thing for uh, RVO is uh, in the TNE guideline expressed like this. So in this view, you have the left atrium, left ventricle alpha track, and you can see actually the filling of your LV and eventually the swirling towards the apex and that the contraction, the ejection in your alpha track. This is the perfect view to actually get your LVO and what we call the isovolume elastication time. 
So if I put a pulse wave Doppler at the junction of my filling and ejection, which is that junction of red and blue, I can get to see a portion of my ejection and eventually I can see my filling time. And I know that between the end of my ejection and the beginning of my filling, there's a portion of time that calls, that's called the isovolumetric relaxation time. So I can measure this time duration here. Okay, this is the ejection of the LV and this is the beginning of the filling and in between I get my isovolumetric relaxation time. And we know that the IVRT will start decreasing if there's significant LV filling from pulmonary overcirculation, especially when you have, for example, a big left right shunt by the PDA. Okay, so this are just graphic re representation where you get your um, ejection time, your ejection, and then you get your, your filling. So this, sorry, this is your ejection. This is your filling, and you can see that this time duration is the isovolumetric relaxation time. And what's happening before that is actually the isovolumetric contraction time. So IVCT and IVRT. And we can use these markers to calculate something called the microbial performance index, exactly, or the time index. Now, with more and more um, advancement of the literature, most uh, recommendation has changed to use tissue Doppler imaging because it provides you much more granularity in terms of temporal resolution and information on these time periods of the cardiac cycle. And so tissue Doppler imaging, the same way that you can use Doppler to assess velocities of blood flow in the heart or extra cardiac, you can use Doppler to assess the velocity of the motion of the myocardium. And so the tissue Doppler can inform you on some of these timing of the cardiac cycle and also how fast the myocardial contraction or relaxation, relaxation is happening. So the problem with TDI is that it's angle dependent. It's also influenced by tethering effect of the myocardium. So part of the myocardium are like just not moving and they're, they're just you know not contracting and they're just moving with other pieces of myocardium that are contracting. So being dragged by other portions so that the TDI won't necessarily tell you. It's only assessing uh, the area under the base in the most uh, standardized TDI assessments. So of course you could put TDI anywhere you want, but you know guidelines have really advocated for the use of TDIs in only certain areas of the heart and in ethical views. So it won't necessarily provide you all the information on all the types of uh, the muscle wall and all areas of the muscle wall. The other thing it informs you on mostly the longitudinal function um, and less on the properties of circumferential contraction and relaxation. So, so it's not as uh, comprehensive than, you know, uh, it's not a comprehensive measure. Basically, it's just one of the measures that we use. And so you can use TDI where you get, um, you remember I told you, and so it's typically used in, uh, in the apical view. So you see that's the apex of, this is the right ventricle, this is the septum, and this is the left ventricle. And you can see here, actually, my angle is, is very high. Like the wall is mo moving like up and down here, and my angle is like going up to here. So I have like at least 30 degrees. It's probably acceptable, but I find it to be a bit high if I criticize myself. Ideally, you almost want to be like kind of in front of your wall that you're assessing. So often the septum, it's easier to be in front of it. You get the least amount of uh, angle of insulation. That's why often in adults, they use septal values for the LV. The problem is that the septum is shared between the RV and the LV. So you assume that the septum is owned by the left ventricle, but it's actually owned by both ventricles. Uh, and you can do it with the RV. So the idea is that you're sampling, it's a, it's a pulse wave Doppler, pretty much. You're sampling the velocity of the myocardium just below the attachment of the valve, tricuspid or mitral. This should be a bit higher, actually. It should really be below the valve. And um, we know that in systole, it's going to be red because it's coming towards the probe. And in diastole, it's going to be blue because it's going away from the probe. And because it's a pulse wave Doppler, it's an instantaneous value of velocity. So if I go back, 
you get a systolic deflection. So we can measure the peak of this systolic deflection. We call this the systolic wave, uh, the systolic velocity. You can then get also an early myocardial relaxation velocity and a late myocardial relaxation velocity. And these represent the velocity during the early filling phase and during the atrial contraction when the muscle is actually expanding because of the filling. And when we're doing an E on E prime ratio, we're basically taking the velocity of the blood flow during this early phase and the velocity of the muscle during this early phase, and we're doing the ratio of that. Then you can do, um, you can measure the time periods. So we know that this is the ejection time. We know that this portion is the isovolumetric contraction time because it's between the diastole and the systole. So it's just before contraction. And then this is just before relaxation. It's the isovolumetric relaxation time before you start filling. Now, the myocardial performance index is basically the isometric contraction time plus the isometric relaxation time, all of this divided by the LV ejection time. So you can see that it includes systolic markers and relaxation marker. And these timings will change depending on if you get systolic or diastolic dysfunction. So this marker is actually a global marker of combined systolic and diastolic function. And it's used a lot in the literature of like chemotherapies, like entracycline related toxicity to the heart. So more and more, this has been integrated in some of the comprehensive assessments of RV and LV function to try to better delineate some of the subtle changes in the, in the, in the function of the RV or the LV in various uh, disease states. So it's definitely something we do measure in our research echoes, but I must admit clinically, it's something that I not necessarily use personally on a daily basis. It's mostly something that I use in research to see if there's subtle differences, because I'm not so sure that clinically it, it really, uh, you know, it's able to depict uh, subtle changes that will be meaningful for our patient population, but that I don't know. That's why we need to do research to quantify and then see if there's markers that are more sensitive to detect certain disease states and, and that are, you know, associated to meaningful outcomes. So here, this is a IVCT, this is the IVRT, and this is the ejection time. So if you measure, if you do one measurement here, one measurement here, and one measurement here, you've done three measurements. And obviously, each time you measure, you increase the error of measurements. So that's why most guidelines will recommend to do two measurements instead of three measurements. They'll tell you, measure the entire duration of these three time cycles, measure the ejection time, and you know that if you take B and you remove A, you're going to get the summation between the IVCT and the IVRT. So often the MPI is this value, B, minus this value, which is the ejection time, A, divided by A. Sorry, it's not divided by B. It's divided by A. This is a mistake. OK, it's divided by ejection time. Does that make sense? So yeah, here it's, it's the, yeah, it's, again, I did the mistake. It's, no, it's this B, B is ejection time, so it's good. So it's A minus B divided by B, which is ejection time. Because why? Because A minus B gives you this ICT plus IRT. And so technically you could be doing the MPI using pulse wave Doppler of the blood flow, because I told you, we could get the ejection time. And you can actually derive the IVCT and RVIT based on the Dopplers. But because pulse wave Doppler of blood flow is much less uh, granular in terms of temporal resolution, most people will calculate now the, the TI index or the MPI index on the TDI, much less on pulse wave. This is only the reason, only for the resolution Resolution, but also because you're you're increasing your error of sampling. Because to do it with pulse wave, you actually need to get two Dopplers. Versus here, you're doing it on the same Doppler. And as you know, there's always going to be beat to beat variation in loading conditions, in heart rate, uh, in afterload. So 
the more you have to take clips to measure this one marker, the more you increase the risk of sampling mistakes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So this is for TDI. So this is an example where you're very well aligned. You can see the line is actually on the septum. That's very good. So you can see the S, the E, the A, you can see the IVCT, the IVRT, IVCT, IVRT, and you can do the S prime. And if you don't see it well, sometimes you need to change your scale to really fill your entire space. And sometimes you need to spread out. You need to have less compression to really see all your time, your time differences. So that's an example of systolic, early and late. So E, A, S, this is on the uh, mitral lateral wall, mitral lateral wall. And then same thing you can do on the RV lateral wall. So S and E and A, and there's normative value. There's a lot of normative value that have been described. Uh, this is an example of going from this to here. So we call this the mitral valve, um, uh, the MCO, so from the mitral closure to the mitral opening, basically. That's why we call it the mitral MCO. So it, it combines the IVCT, IVRT, and ejection time. Um, and then you have the LV ejection time, and it provides you the MPI. And so there's values that are in free terms and healthy terms that have been described. These are on the normative value section of the Neocardiolab uh, website. And you have S prime, E prime, A prime values for the free wall, for the septum and the RV free wall on day one, day two, day five to seven, 36 weeks. And you have values in healthy term babies at around one days of life. <clears throat> and so you have here values and standards, norm normative averages and standard deviations, uh, as well as myocardial performance index. So you can see that the MPI also changes with time. Uh, and extremes of values have been associated with either abnormal diastolic or systolic function. So values that are way too low, like 0 0.3, or values that are very high, like in the 0 0.9s, are probably not normal in babies uh, that are like one to two days uh, and above. LV mass, I want to mention it because it's something you're going to be doing. There's different methods to do LV mass. You can do LV mass using the, the M mode. Uh, with all the diameters of the septum and the posterior wall, and it will calculate automatically uh, based on certain equation. Um, more and more, the um, ASC is recommending to measure LV mass, and that's particularly true for pediatric and adult literature, but LV mass using metrics using bidimensional measurements or tridimensional measurements. So for example, this is one of the uh, techniques. There's the aerial length, there's the truncated ellipsoid method, and there's 3D echo that you can do. So in this method, what you do, you actually measure the endocardium and epicardium. And then in four chamber, when you're in diastole, you, um, you measure the length. And it will calculate using this equation, the LV mass of, uh, of your left ventricle. So this is an example where we do it on tap -C. So that's LV mass area length, where you go in short axis at the papillary muscle view, you trace the area in uh, the, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the area of the epicardium and the area of the endocardium. And then you go into the four chamber view in diastole and you measure your, di your length from the mitral valve to the apex, and it will provide you uh, an estimate of the LV mass in ground. Uh, so, so you can see this representation here. Uh, there's the other uh, technique that's called the trunc truncated ellipsoid method. The equation is here. So it's the same thing. You do the epi and the endo, and this time you add one measurement, which is the diameter mid cavity of the LV in the same view. Now, the, the, the complexity of it is that you see uh, there's an A, a D, a T, a D, blah, blah, blah. So, so the truncated ellipsoid, you really need in Tomtech to redo it from scratch. You cannot reuse the same tracing. That's a, you have to redo the tracing of the FP and the endo, despite the fact that you've done it for the first technique. Okay, and it provides you an assessment of the mass. 
this is more for research, like for research, because one of the projects that we're doing is on steroids. So we're trying to see its impact on like LV mats. So it's something you're going to be that some of you may be using in your in your projects. Again, as I mentioned, you can use the uh, M mode, which will take into context the posterior wall here and the septum, and it will give you an assessment of the LV mass. So this patient, you can see, is eight gram, which is kind of similar and it's not so bad to what we got with the uh, with the other method. Okay. But what what you said that the uh, LV mass by the M mode. Is this courage? It's this courage because of the uh, because you can the um, the angulation of it. it. It's very angle dependent. Also, you may have some uh, hypertrophy in certain areas of your ventricle that that might be very localized and that you will not pick up with your end mode. So think about infant of diabetic mother who may have more septal hypertrophy that may not be well picked up depending on the section that you decided to do your line of interrogation. And that's why by using other techniques like 3D echo or by using the uh, tridimensional technique, which is like, for example, truncated ellipsoid, you're really trying to like get at least an assessment. It's not like the 3D, the entire 3D, but at least you're able to get an assessment of at least the entire LV in one section. So if there's hypertrophy here that you would not get if you put your line of interrogation in the middle, you would still be able to get a sense of that in terms of the expression in the LV mass. It makes sense? Yep. Okay, I promise I'm almost finished because I know you're all hungry and you want to go. So uh, just to finish the apical view, there's a concept that's called the DPDT. So this is very research-based or adult-based, but it's sometimes used in certain population of pediatric patients with congenital heart defect. The LV will generate a lot of pressure as well as the RV will generate a lot of pressure during contraction. And it will generate this pressure quickly. So as I told you, LV that starts to become dysfunctional or RV that starts to become dysfunctional takes more time to empty. And this speed of emptying, the speed of the velocity it generates is going to start to become slower and slower. So DPDT is what? Is when you take the advantage of the mitral insufficiency to measure the speed at which pressure is being generated. So as you can see here, it tells you the left ventricle should be able to generate 1,200 millimeters of mercury per second. So if you go from the velocity, so this is a mitral regurgitation jet or mitral insufficiency jet, the velocity of one, if you go Bernoulli, one times one times four gives you four. Three times three times four gives you 36 millimeters of mercury. So the time it takes to go from four millimeters of mercury to 36 millimeters of mercury is gonna be the time duration you're gonna input into that. So it tells you this is the amount of time it takes for the left ventricle to go from four millimeters of mercury to three millimeters of mercury to, to, to from, sorry, from one meter per second to three meters per second, which corresponds from four millimeters of mercury to 36 millimeters of mercury. And so with this time, it tells you how much time did it take? It gives you what we call a delta of pressure over a delta of time. So example, if I do MR, and I go from one to three, which is three is here. So you see two milli, uh, so one meter per second, two meter per second, three meters per second, four meter per second, five meter per second. So if I trace a line here, it gets me to one. And if I trace a line here, it gets me to three. And I, if I calculate how much time does it take me to go from this point to this point along the curve, and I plug it in my equation, it tells me that my ventricle was able to generate 1,200 millimeters of mercury per second, which is normal. In someone who has more LV dysfunction, you can see that this DPDT is going to start decreasing. It takes more time, and the velocity it's able to generate, the force that it's, the pressure that it's able to generate in time takes more time. So you go from one to three, and that provides you information about the LV function. You can do the same for TR. 
So that's another example of for, um, for the MR. So you can see that it was able to go from four millimeters of mercury to 36 millimeters of mercury. So the delta is 32, 36 minus four gives you 30. <laughs> and it took this, this amount of time took 0 0.025 second. So 2.5 millisecond or yeah, 25 million, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, and it's because the, the marker is in millimeters of mercury per second, 32 divided by 0 0.025 is 1,400 millimeters of mercury per second. That's obviously, it's a marker that's also dependent on LA pressure, because if your LA pressure is very high or the, or the RV, if the RE pressure is very high, you know, Bernoulli is a, is a gradient. It's not, you know, it's not, but, but it still gives you an assessment if you're able to follow it. And it's something sometimes we use in patients with like, for example, hypoplastic left heart. We apply this technology to the RD. Uh, another thing that I mentioned, you remember I told you, you can measure the systolic to diastolic time ratio. So you can use the MR or you can use the TR to actually measure the timing of ventricular systole and the timing of ventricular diastole. And the longer this ratio is gonna be S on D, the more there's a sign that there's a struggle of this ventricle. So for example, I've done it here on the RV. So you do the duration of your systole, which is number one, it's at 245 millisecond. And that's the duration of your diastole. It's 140 millisecond. And you can do this ratio as a marker. And, and there's publication in the BPD population to follow patients who have uh, RV compromise in the context of pulmonary hypertension. It's, it's a marker that can be used. It's also something we're gonna be using and measuring in our population of uh, the research project with pulmonary hypertension. So again, another example, you're measuring the systolic time uh, duration, the diastolic time duration, and you can do the ratio. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the velocity flow propagation, but I've put- I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. For the SD ratio in the MR, uh, yeah. could you sh could you show me the no the normal value because I can't yeah. find in any it's reference. Here. This is in the newborn. Yeah, there's no values for the newborn. Oh, so yeah. you assume that it's the same than adults. Oops, let me just. Oh, okay. Yeah, you assume that it's the same than adults. Just give me two seconds. Uh, let me go on here. So if you go, if you go DPDT like here, so I put in the adult section like a whole, uh, you know, information about DT, DPDT. The DPDT normal that's been described for the right ventricle is more than 400 millimeters of mercury per second. And the difference is that, as you know, it's very, it's very rare your TR goes up to three meters per second, right? Because why? Because the PA pressure is typically low. So your RVRA is supposed to be low. So when you're calculating the DPDT of the RV, most have used uh, the value to go from one to two meters per second. So you go to one, you go to two meters per second, and then you put, you you go from the one to the two, and then you get the duration, which the delta time here is like three point fifty two milliseconds. Do you see what I mean? So the difference between the LV, the LV you go from one to three meters per second. The RV is from one to two meters per second, and a normal DPDT of an RV is supposed to be above a hundred millimeters mercury per second, and a normal DPDT of an LV is supposed to be above a thousand two hundred millisecond. So the way I would calculate that is that you know. One meter per second corresponds to four. Four, two, uh, four millimeters of mercury. Two meters per second is two times two equal four. Four times four equals 16. This is 16 millimeters of mercury. So 16 minus four gives you 12. And if you divide 12 by 3.52 millisecond, it gets gonna give you the DPDT. So 3.52 millisecond in second. So that's 0, 0.0 blah, blah, blah. So if you do 12 divided by this, it's 3,400. So it's way above 400. It's mean that uh, we should draw the line in the axis. It's oh, from here to here. 
So you follow your PR. You follow your okay. PR. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, but you follow the line of your PR. Because that's basically the velocity generation. So when systole starts, it's how much time does it take for your RV to be able to build this pressure, basically. It's a bit but of a... Yeah. Is, so in the number is a one, two, three on the left upper? One, two, three on the velocity. So, um, so one, so the reason I, I put that is because I always put, I told you the, how much time does it take to go from one meter per second to two meter per second. So mm -hmm. what I typically do is I initially go on my curve and I locate one meter per second, which corresponds oh. to here. Then I locate the two meters per second, which corresponds to here. And then I trace the distance between my one and my two, and it gives me my delta time, which is 3.52 meter per second. Oh, I see. If I use the MR, I should find it three meters per second. Right? Exactly. If it's MR, it's going to be three meters per second. Oh, I see. And yeah. how about the normal reference for the S systolic and the asteric ratio? Yeah, I'll show it to you. So, uh, let's see. I think I put it here. Um, So this paper, this paper describe differences in eccentricity and systolic diastolic ratio in extremely low birth weights with BPD at risk of pulmonary hypertension. And they measure the systolic to diastolic time ratio. So they didn't publish normative value, but they provided some insight about how differences can be shown between the population with and without pulmonary hypertension. So I actually invite you to go read this paper because I think it's a it's an interesting paper. It's one of the first that describe the use of eccentricity index and of this systolic to diastolic time ratio. And what they show is that those with BPD pulmonary hypertension, they had um, higher systolic to diastolic time ratio compared to those without pulmonary hypertension. So you could go back into their papers and you can see that the SD ratio uh, they put it here, systolic to diastolic time ratio. So you can see this is BPD only, this is BPD with pulmonary hypertension, and this is the controls. And you can see that the patients, let me try to reopen, wait, it's asking me to wait. You can see that the babies that have values like above 1.4 here, um, with BPD and pH, they were, all within the pulmonary hypertension group. The, the problem is like, you can see, this is the controls, like term controls. So you can see you have some term controls up to 1.6. That's where it becomes a difficulty. So for sure above 1.6, but this, this is a fringe, for sure it's gonna be abnormal. This like, at least in their cohort, it was abnormal. So, so it's more a marker to try to, it's to put together with other markers. But if you have values above 1.4, 1.6, it start to be a value of concern. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Okay. But there's yep. no real like cutoff of normal that's been described yet. So the last few things that I had for the apical view was, uh, the last thing that I had for apical view is the flow propagation, the velocity flow propagation. It's a marker that's been described mostly in adult and pediatric literature. And I would recommend you can go read on it but I'm not going to dwell on this because it's much less used. Uh, and if you see my screen, it's basically using color and MO through the inflow of the mitral valve. And it's using the area of aliasing to actually measure um, the uh, duration of this, of this flow propagation. So here I'm measuring it here. So you can see the flow propagation here. And it's the duration of how long this takes for it, the aliasing, which is 13 milliseconds. And there's no real... Uh, normal values, but we know that adults with diastolic dysfunction, they start getting increasing timing of, of duration. And this marker is not something we get on our echoes, to be honest. So it's not something you'll be able to measure anyways. Uh, 
at least up, up to now, we, we were not including this in our echoes. It's been also abandoned in the recent literature, to be honest, like most uh, most guidelines on diastolic the dysfunction, don't, they don't even include that anymore. So this was the initial portion. We just tackled the first few views. We haven't done yet the subcostal and the suprasternal and the PDA view. We haven't done strain and, and 3D. I hope that was useful. So I'm gonna stop the recording and, and uh, okay. we'll do another recording next time. Okay. Oh, okay.